This is a big date in wrestling, as I tried to find my notes. Raw 221, August 4th, 1997. The day after SummerSlam. You know, I was just earlier, actually all week now, I have been doing the Death of WCW audiobook. I am in year 1999, halfway through. And so I have been essentially reading to myself about all of this stuff that's happening during this period. Especially the Lex Luger title switch. Ah. Uh. I can't wait to talk about this later. We're starting with Raw, which was which was also a historic show, by the way. It was, for different reasons. Hart Foundation comes out for a promo the night after Bret Hart beat The Undertaker to win his fifth world title. He's coming down, he's waving his flag, he's got the championship belt over his shoulder. They're all happy. And they had still shots of the finish at SummerSlam, where Bret spat in Shawn Michaels' face, so Shawn swung a chair at him, but hit Taker, and Bret made the cover... And Sean had to count the three with Sean and Brett staring each other eye to eye. And the more crazy stuff that happens, the longer it gets postponed, the build for Sean Brett 2 gets better and better and better. So, there was nobody in this building. It was a small building and it was dark. Brett said he's proved once again he's the best there ever will be. Best there is, best there was, best there ever will be. He's overcome death and the devil in despair. But the ref determined to screw him and he won the championship. He said that per the stipulations going into the match, if Sean showed any favoritism towards the Undertaker at SummerSlam, he was supposed to be banned from the U.S. forever. And though Brett won the title, he said, it was very clear Sean favored Taker from the start to the finish. I want the WWF to stick to their word. I want Sean Michaels banned from American wrestling. You know what? He had a very good point. He wanted them to do the right thing. It was obvious, blatant favoritism. And so he wanted WWE to get rid of this guy. Hmm. As they said they would. That's right. Are you going to stick to your word? And I just realized, apparently not. They didn't. Yes, but in That's the end. very, very sad baby right there. In the end, Brett still has the title and Sean countered the three count. Mm -hmm. That is true. That is true. But no one addressed it. I was all, I was in awe because it was a stipulation that they were following up on, and I was expecting some sort of... Explanation? At least somebody to come out and say, fuck off, dude. You started <laughs> it by spitting on the guy. Something. We didn't get anything. So, Jim Ross notes that uh, Brett's first title defense will be at the next pay-per-view, Ground Zero, against the Patriot, because Patriot beat Bret Hart last week. So, Brett says Patriot's win was a fluke. It was all Shawn Michaels' interference. Everyone knew it. He ran down what his buddies did at SummerSlam, said Ken Shamrock would never get another shot at British Bulldogs European Championship. Brian Pillman was not going to wear a dress. And Owen Hart losing to Steve Austin was another example of American justice. He gave Owen a chance to speak. Let's talk a little bit more about his verbiage here. He said the Patriot win was a total fluke. The Patriot meant nothing to him. He was very happy that Bulldog beat Shamrock because Ken had made a mockery of everything and he would never get a title shot again. And as far as Pillman goes, this is the Hart Foundation. They do not wear dresses. He's the champion. He's the new sheriff in town. And the sheriff says, Brian Pillman has too much class to wear a stupid dress. When I was young, I loved Bret Hart. I love him so much more now. <laughs> I thought he was the best. And I understated... I misunderstood exactly how great this man was. He's fucking unbelievable. So moving on to Owen Hart. For those of you who did not know or never saw the match, and it's been many, many years since I've seen this, the finish was Owen giving Austin a pile driver and nearly legit killing him. That's right. And they were just barely able to get Austin on top of Owen for a pinfall, and then Austin immediately collapsed, essentially. And so Owen explains he was mad at himself because after he dropped Steve Austin on his head and Austin was injured, he showed compassion. Austin didn't beat him. He beat himself. And the bottom line was after, after the match, he was walking around. Steve Austin was a crippled freak who would never wrestle again. So Austin should man up and forfeit the IC title back to Owen. And then they showed the pile driver in slow, brutal motion. This is how not to take it, everyone. And this is why wrestling is dangerous. Dude, it's how not to take it. It's how not to deliver it. Yeah. This was not all Steve Austin's fault. I, I would say close to zero. Yeah. 
and we'll, and we'll have more to say on that too. Regardless, yeah, this is this was a stomach churning to watch. So out comes the new commissioner, Sergeant Slaughter. He gives Brett a brow beating. He repeats that Brett's going to defend his title against the Patriot. Says Shamrock will at some point get a rematch against the Bulldog, and it'll happen soon. And then he goes to address Mr. Pillman. And Pillman can sense impending doom. And the look of terror that came over his face. And Slaughter says, you lost that match to Goldust. Per the stipulations, you are going to our address tonight or you will be suspended. And further, as a guy came in later to me, the instant later, mm-hmm. uh, he says, Owen will get a rematch against Austin when Austin is medically cleared and, and when Stone Cold says so. This made Owen happy. So Austin comes out, huge ovation. The fans were screaming so loud. You couldn't even hear the announcers. Yes. If you would put a gun to my head and ask me if Stone Cold Steve Austin was out the night after SummerSlam, I probably would have said no. You know, this is like Henry Godwin. I no, remember. It's like that, <laughs> no, it is. I'll tell you why. I remember that after he got hurt, they did everything that they could to get him on TV as frequently as possible, even though he couldn't wrestle. Like every week they would announce that he was going to be in a match, but then he wouldn't actually wrestle. Right. But I do not remember him being out there the next day doing a physical angle. That's madness. Yeah, he was hurt really bad. He comes out in street clothes. This would never happen today. No, and frankly, that's good. He's defying death just being there. He says, Owen, you were too stupid to pin me when you had the chance. You're a loser, and I'm going to whip your ass tonight. And everyone went crazy and he left. So their big thing of the 90s was, let's get clips of all the fans before and after the shows. In the 90s? This has been like the last three weeks they decided to do this. Well, apparently... Hopefully the fourth week they smarten up. Oh, come on. What amazed me about this is they're interviewing these fans, and they're all upset at Shawn Michaels. Now, I remember this match. Shawn didn't mean, he didn't intend to hit Undertaker. He didn't want to count the pin for Bret Hart. But these fucking fans are like, God damn, Shawn Michaels. Fuck this guy. I was like, man. He, if, he, if he hadn't chosen to get involved, no one... Made him swing a chair after Brett spat at him. He should have waited his turn until Taker, Taker killed him. Man, oh man. Farouk does a backstage promo. Hyping to be a triple threat against Savio Vega and Crush at Ground Zero. Ken Shamrock versus Kama in a real UFC guy versus fake UFC guy match. This boring ass fucking match mm-hmm. just sucked. Kama did some very fake UFC. He did fake kickboxing. They did some fake Muay Thai. There was some wrestling and brawling involved. The nation comes out to intimidate Shamrock. Slaughter ejects them. So, Kama ends up on the floor. The Bariquas come out. They attack him, throw him in the ring, and Shamrock pins him with a suplex. And Kama no sells everything. He chases the Bariquas through the crowd, and Shamrock is just confused. This sucked. I enjoyed it while it lasted. You did? Wow. It had, a, it had a certain charm. It was different. It had a certain charm. It was three minutes is what it was. It was also short. This is, yeah, that's a good point. I would not have enjoyed this over six minutes. Brockus is still coming. You watch these promos. Take your time, dude. <laughs> no hurry. Go the long way. He's ridiculously jacked up and ripped. They're shooting him all in shadow. He's screaming in German, which is an angry sounding language anyway. He comes off totally terrifying and scary and a foreigner, which is we've seen throughout this show being a foreigner is the automatic heel. But all he does is call out other heels. He called out the nation last week and this week he called out Hunter Hearst Helmsley. So this big growling scary man is a baby face. A hero. Takamichinoku, or as they called him even after signing him, Takamichinoko. Which was even funnier because Sonny came out to announce and she got it right. Well, you see, Sonny read The Observer, <laughs> and Vince McMahon did not. It was actually Vince and Ross both called him Takamichunoko. Yeah. So, more comedy. Talk is announced at 201 pounds. Mm-hmm. Clearly, he was not weighed in for the Cruiserweight Classic. No. I don't buy that weight. Well, they're, they're talking about it here. I'm watching this match thinking, Brian Christopher's 50 pounds bigger than him. Easy. <laughs> they're saying... Vince keeps saying, Christopher, the bigger man here by some 15 pounds. 15 pounds? 115 pounds. Yeah. 
And then finally, Dross says, you know, that weight at 201 pounds, that was bullshit. <laughs> so almost his exact words. So Christopher took 98% of this match. Taka got in his one springboard dive, which is awesome. And Christopher cut him off immediately. And somewhere in here, Taka reversed a suplex out of nowhere. Hit a small package for the win. And then Christopher beat him up, beat him up, beat him up afterwards and threw him out of the ring. What a jobber. This is their debut for the guy they just signed. Yeah. He lost twice to Sasuke. And he won here, but they made him look like a total geek in the process. I know it's only been 19 years, but man, times have changed. Jerry the Lawler and Jerry the King Lawler and his quasi racist jokes. <laughs> Dude, every week he was doing this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were correct. Slaughter met with Pillman backstage, and here is where he didn't only present him with a dress. He said, you are going to wear this tonight, and in fact, you're going to wear it every week on Raw until you win a match. You know, I don't know if it's because Slaughter was a worker for so long, or maybe they just knew what they were doing back then, but this was so different from nowadays, where Stephanie comes out and just destroys the performers. It makes them come across as total geeks. Pillman lost a match where now he has to wear a dress. He just flat out says, I'm not going to wear the dress. And then Slaughter comes up and without making Pillman look like a total geek, he just makes it very clear, you lost and you're going to wear this goddamn dress or I'm going to suspend you. He didn't make the guy look like a mid-card geek. All he did was come out and he showed the world that he was in charge. And this was just the way that things were going to be. It was great. I don't think it's so much that he's a worker for so long as much as just he's a rational human being and not crazy and insecure. That could also be. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Vader. That's part of it. Stephanie has to, she has to let us know every week that she's in charge. Yes. Yep. No shit. We know you're in fucking charge. All they had to say one time on the show was Sergeant Slaughter is the commissioner. He didn't have to hammer it home in every single fucking segment that he was in charge. We know that. So is it a writing thing or is it an insecurity thing? Both. It's a McMahon thing. It's a family thing. Hunter does the same thing. That's true. Right? Every That's true. week Even we have Merit to know McMahon. that he's the best. So Paul Barrett does a quick backstage promo saying China's no match for him. He's more of a man than she'd ever be. Hmm. He said Hunter had also a grueling cage match against mankind the night before while Vader had enjoyed a night off. So Vader was fresh here. Hunter was the default babyface, although really no one cared about either guy. Bearer trips Hunter as he's running the ropes. So China takes Bearer out with a drop kick. And throughout, this company has had its ups and downs, but they almost, almost never screw something up. As bad as, they almost never screw something up as bad as they screwed this up. Because China drop kicks Paul Bearer on the floor. It's obviously, the obviously knew it was going to happen. It was the big spot led to the finish. They couldn't get any camera to get a shot of it. No. Well, part of the thing is Paul Bear is so fat. They, yeah, but they had the camera. blocked every view. Well, they, they did have the, the first camera they used. The Paul Bear is between the camera and China, so that didn't work. But they cut to a wide shot, and you see, okay, there's China. And then she starts to run, and you think, the camera's going to follow her. No, the camera stays still. So she just runs off screen. I did like it. Paul took the bump, and then... I don't know if he actually hit his head on the guardrail, but he sold it like he did. Watching this first, it, because I, I only saw Bear fall down and it's what happened, I legit thought a fan had attacked him. <laughs> so this very quickly led to a double count out, which pissed off everyone in the match and all the fans. Now let's talk about the real main event of the show. The Patriot promo. The Patriot cut a promo. <laughs> this guy is my favorite. There are things wrong with this country. And unlike Brett, I'm going to take a stand and try to correct some of these problems. You realize the whole southern part of the nation hates you right do now? Do you know? Do you know what the problems are with this country in the mid-90s? The, the fucking country. Not the oh. company. The country. <laughs> oh, oh. You know what the problems with the country are? Brett Hart. It's a problem with this country. I was trying to figure out how he's going to make the country a better place by wrestling. It's not even that Brett Hart is the problem with the country. The fact that Bret Hart is making fun of the country is the problem with America in the late 90s. Yeah. Granny's right. It was a simpler time back then. <laughs> that is true. 
Yeah, love it or leave it. He did, he did say that. He vowed to send Brett back to Canada. He cuts this whole promo about how Brett's a whiner, and if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't love the U.S., he can get out. He says, "I'm going to prove my win wasn't a fluke. I'm going to send Brett back to Canada." I don't think he ever mentioned the world championship would be on the line. Well, we all know that. An obscure it's, detail. He's not fighting for the world, Vinny. That's true. He's fighting for <laughs> he's, he's old right. glory. Should have been a U.S. title match. Patriot coming out to Kurt Angle's music will never not be weird. I got to say right. about his promo, it kind of was a hell of a promo, but my God, he talks fast. Yes. For a Southerner, he talks very fast. It is, by the way, especially since uh, Vince Jr. took over, is this the quickest anyone's gone from being in the company to fighting for the world title on a major show? I doubt it. It's been like six weeks. It well, you know, they needed a guy. does not happen often. Well, listen, Vinny, they, they, they locked in to this U.S. versus Canada feud. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, it's like, Jesus Christ, we got to get an American quick. Anyone for the Thank God Del Wilkes is out there with that fucking mask on. That's right. That's what we need. They keep calling him the Patriot Del Wilkes. So let's see other highlights here. Uh, the Sultan, who is, of course, a Samoan, Introduced as hailing from the Middle East. <laughs> well, you know. Whoever we don't like at this particular time. Uh, I did like when Patriot threw a discus punch, but he spun away from the direction that he throws the punch. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they wanted a new Kerry Von Erich. I guess so. With a mask on. Hey, Kerry Von Erich screwed up a lot of stuff. But when, he was, when he was throwing a right-hand punch, he spun to his right. Well, he had a reason to. He's missing a foot. I guess that's true. Let's let's talk. Let's just get to the point. So Patriot wins in two minutes. Sultan is allegedly undefeated. Yes. And so that was the key that Patriot tra Patriot beat the undefeated man to set up his championship. But we match. haven't seen the Sultan in a couple of months. He doesn't matter. Not one. <laughs> so because he hasn't wrestled. His record is one zero oh, and one. He's like he's like Sid, where they just invent a win streak as things goes see. on. So Brett comes out afterwards, and Patriot is vigorously waving the flag at him. And everyone's chanting USA. And Bret Hart looks towards the back for his friends to come out. And the fucking Patriot jumps off the apron well, like a total dick. Yes. And attacks him. Okay. Bret came out with his friends, but Sarge blocked his friends. Mm -hmm. So Bret thought he had backup. He had backup when he left the stage, but he was alone when he gets down to the bottom of the ramp. So that does not defend the Patriot. Oh, no. I'm not. Is I am patriotic. No, no, I'm not defending the Patriot at all. Patriot was a dick. But my favorite part of this, they're doing this stare down. Brett and the Patriot are. And Brett, of course, thinks Owen and Bulldog are right behind him. And at some point, it gets to the point where he says, this has gone long enough. I'm going to have my crew kill him. And he turns just slightly to his right, and there's no Owen. And he turns slightly to his left, and there's no Bulldog. And then he turns all the way around, turns his back to the ring. And the key here is, and this may have only amused me, and I don't care. It's my job to talk about this. They put a camera essentially on the ramp. So you saw Brett's whole body and facial expression when he turned around to wonder where his friends had gone. Brian, I know you've never seen Pulp Fiction. But there is... What? No, listen. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. There is a meme from that movie that grew popular just like in the past year or two. Where there's a confused John Travolta. And he looks back and forth with a blank expression and shrugs. So, help me, God, that is what Bret Hart did here. And I laughed till I cried. I'm sure that's where John Travolta got it. I'm sure it is, even though this movie was... Watching this over and over again. Came out three... Th this was done three years after the movie. Bret was aping Travolta. The point is, I laughed. Then Patriot attacked Bret Hart like a dick. <laughs> Key to all of this is Bret was right about those Americans. He absolutely was right. He had a point. He gets jumped from behind. He makes his comeback. It's a fair fight by the end. Then it gets separated and Brett gets pulled away. And he's saying, he jumped me. I was going to give him the ass what he deserved. Also, the show was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And somewhere in here, I saw a straw hat guy. <laughs> Vince brings Shawn Michaels out for a promo. I got to talk about this. Shawn is already going hardcore into his DX mode. And he's dancing and is shaking his ass and everybody's booing. And he cuts a heel promo. He cuts a promo. He yells at Vince. He makes fun of Vince. Vince gives him the mic and tells him to get out of here. And cuts his awesome promo on The Undertaker because they're having a match at the next pay-per-view. Their paths have never crossed before. And I'm going to super kick my foot right down your throat. Point of this is... Vince asked him if he was in cahoots with Bret Hart. And this was what totally set Sean off. And that's what got me thinking. 
what was their plan at this moment? Because clearly the idea was Brett wins a title at SummerSlam and Shawn Michaels is going to win the title from Brett at WrestleMania. Brett is very clearly a heel, but now Shawn is turning heel and they both still hate each other. So what was the idea and who was going to turn babyface? Nobody has any idea. Are we sure they didn't know Steve Austin would be back by then? I mean, maybe that was the plan, but they had been think, wanting to do Brett plan. versus Sean forever. I hadn't thought about it until right now, so I'm kind of making this up as I go. I'm I'm guessing they were still banking on Austin being at Mania. Or they already had Montreal booked, and Brett... No, that doesn't make sense either. Because Brett's not going to lose to Sean in Montreal. No. I don't know when Brett was going to lose this belt to Sean. Has Brett... Has he gotten the bombshell when Vince said, I need you to leave? This was shortly thereafter. Okay, so, so they, had, they had already planned on being out the door at some point. No, they had not yet. Uh, not they, yet. They would not have given him the title if Vince would have known at this point. That's, it was a well, few yeah, more months true. before that's Vince true. decided, I need to get rid of my champion. Okay, here's my guess that I'm putting together out of thin air. Uh, they, maybe they did want to do Sean and Brett at Mania, in which case they needed to keep them separated for six months or so until then. A lot more than that, actually. Closer, you know, three quarters of a year. So maybe they figure we'll have Sean do the heel turn now. That will keep them apart. And then sometime between the Rumble and Mania, one of them will turn babyface and then we do the rematch. I don't know. That's my guess. My only other thought was maybe Sean was only turning heel for three months while he feuded with The Undertaker. Like when he did the Hulk Hogan feud yeah. in the mid-2000s. But he was bearing the fans to such a degree that this was a very clear heel turn. Yeah, he was... He gave it... Th th this was not a... That one he did cut in Canada two weeks ago where he was cutting heel on... He was cutting a... He was healing on the Canadian fans. This is a heel on all fans everywhere. I also like... He's yelling at Vince. He's telling him to shut up. He's insulting him. And when Vince asks, are you in cahoots with Brett? Which is one of Vince McMahon's favorite phrases, by the way. In cahoots. It comes up with Taker and Kane a lot in the next few years. So, well, clearly they were in cahoots. So Sean says, you must be the dumbest son of a bitch I've ever met. And Vince gets pissed. And Vince says, I don't appreciate that tone. Shawn Michaels, you will be facing the Undertaker at ground zero. And he leaves. And this is so awesome because they had not been broadcasting it. But if you're paying attention, it was very clear Vince was the man in charge by this point. So th this came off as Vince was pissed at Sean for insulting him in the ring. And to punish him, he booked him in a match against the Undertaker. Just like he did with Son Shane in 2016. So Sean don't care. He says... Undertaker, we've never crossed paths in the 10 years we've been around here. You should know, just like Bret Hart knows, I lay down for absolutely nobody. Not for you, not for Bret, not for Vince, not for these fans. He's going off and off and off. He's appalled at this disrespect. And he says, I'm going to super kick, I'm gonna put my super kick down your throat. So Taker's dong sounds, his light show goes off. Sean disappears, <laughs> vanishes. Taker makes his long, slow entrance down to the ring. Vince eventually finds a microphone that works and hands it to Taker. And Taker says he has done too much, too much talking and it's time to go back to taking souls and making people rest in peace. And Sean, you're going to rest in peace. That's all he has to say. He goes back to the ramp, but then there's Paul Bearer on the big screen. He repeats his claim that Taker is a criminal and a murderer. He cackles at Taker for losing the championship, gloating in his loss. He says, I was with Kane last night. And after 20 years, Kane's ready to make his return. Yes, Kane is coming! And the room gets dark, and Taker's music plays. It's the same lights as before. And Taker starts to leave, but then his purple lights turn red. Oh, man. And he's confused, and the announcers are confused. But then everyone just goes on. I thought that was so awesome. Dude, this storyline is awesome. It's awesome. Craig's doubtful, but he knows no, no, that it's I'm been awesome. I'm not doubtful because I know the end. <laughs> yeah. Hell in a Cell. Yeah. Awesome. It was amazing. They showed Sergeant Slaughter talking to a doctor about Steve Austin's spinal shock syndrome. The doctor makes it clear Steve Austin should not wrestle tonight. Dude, this doctor is talking about how this would be such a very bad idea for this man to wrestle. His neck is totally fucked up. This is a horrible idea. He cannot wrestle tonight. And they go back to Vince who goes... 
That's not going to stop Stone Cold. <laughs> he clearly has more guts than brains. I'm like, Jesus. Clearly, this was before the wellness policy. Brack has made that clear. Okay. Ahmed Johnson versus Chains. This is where the show fell off a cliff. Somebody Can somewhere... Can we admit this fucking sucks? Oh, this is beyond terrible. Thank you. This is unimaginably bad. But I want to talk about what I liked. They took Ahmed's music here. <laughs> they took The Rock's theme from WWF The Music Volume 2 and edited it in the Nation of Domination chants. It is awesome and I want it. Please someone let me know where to get it. They had a horrible match. I it was, uh, it was clearly Ahmed was still hurt going into it. I think Ahmed had another injury, and I think this was pretty much the end of the road for this guy. Yes. He fucking wins. He wins! <laughs> and then he gets turned on by his crew, and they beat him up, even though he just joined the Nation of Domination. I believe his tenure in the Nation of Domination consisted of one match and two injuries. What in the fuck is going on? I say Why didn't he lose? I think it was like three weeks. Yeah. He got so lost in this match, he hit a Michinoku driver, and then time stood still, and then he hit another one. Why? I don't know. Who knows? He likes to do sitting body slams. Because he sucks. I like when Chains is throwing chop blocks and Ahmed didn't know what to do. We just stood there. Yeah, this is a horrible match. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Dude, then we got Mosh and Thrash versus the Hog fucking Farmers. Have I mentioned I'm not a fan of the headbangers? Fuck you, Raw. This sucked. So bad. Phineas literally begging for a reaction, not getting it. Can I talk about the goddamn finish and let's just move on? Sure. One of the headbangers had a cradle, but there was no ref. Henry comes up behind him and does a slop drop. Phineas, who had been unable to kick out, just sits on the guy. Vince goes, what the hell is Phineas doing? Apparently not realizing he's pinning him. And then he won. Fucking horrible. Can I speak for a moment? Yes. We just got done watching the Godwins and the Headbangers. The next matchup was Brian Pillman versus Bob Holly, And the stipulation was that Brian Pillman had to wear a dress I see in Craig every is. one of his matches I until see where Craig is he going. lost. Yeah. We just got done watching the headbangers wear dresses in the ring. Yes. I, let me explain. Ridiculous. Let me explain, Craig. I'm proud of you, Craig. And why? Did, I'm going to explain. Hold on. I'm not done yet. They came out in stupid dresses, and one of them you could see his trunks through because it was a see-through number that you could... Okay, and then Pillman comes out. Did he have to wear a thong? Can I... I don't know can why. Can I explain, Craig? Really? Can I explain... Thank you, Russo. You suck. Let's imagine for a moment that Vinny is a better. that Vinny is a cross dresser. Why do we have to imagine? <laughs> yeah, let's imagine because I am so lazy. <laughs> let's imagine that Vinny enjoys you know, walking fair. around in women's clothing. Okay. Okay. So now, if Vinny enjoyed on, walking around it. in women's clothing, <laughs> and he walked into this room, we would accept Vinny. Absolutely. Now, I would if we forced you, Craig, yes, sir. to wear women's clothing, right. you would be outraged. That's the fucking difference. The headbangers enjoyed wearing dresses, okay, but Brian Billman didn't want to wear a dress and was forced to. That's not my point. My point is, if you want to get the stipulation over that a man has to wear a dress, don't put two guys wearing a dress in the match before it. Vinny, am I just, is it going like this? They want to wear dresses. You both have points. I have a very valid point. Pillman doesn't want to wear a fucking dress, unlike these stupid headbangers. He's being humiliated. That's the difference. And he wore a thong because he was so humiliated. Well, Shaved you know what, his legs. I wouldn't be surprised if when he wasn't wearing a dress, Brian that's, Pillman that's wore fair. a thong. The last thing I want to say about this horrible Godwins match. There's more? At one point, Phineas was actually begging for a reaction, and he did not get it. But you could hear... People from, not like a chance, but like one guy in the upper deck just shouting, BORING! And then a different guy would shout, BORING. And then the match. <laughs> Goldust and Marlena came out to take front row seats to watch Pillman in a dress. Ross and Lawler were saying, this is a mistake, we should not be antagonizing this wing nut. <laughs> this wing nut. Yeah. You know, I thought this was awesome. The, the, the reveal was great. 
Pillman no, was, so no, it was not. You could tell what religion the man was. <laughs> Pillman so did not yeah. want to wear a dress. And the key to this is, this was the best reaction to a countout I have seen in 20 years. Because the stipulation is, Pillman must wear a dress on Raw until he beats somebody. And so when he got counted out because he was yelling at Goldust, I have never seen, we'd have to go back to those old NWA WCW shows to see a reaction for a count out like this one. Maybe when Luger beat Yokozuna mm. until everybody figured out, holy shit, the guy didn't win the title. God damn it. Now he's got to come out next week with a dress. And every time he gets fucked, the fans are going to love it. Ooh, maybe he can wrestle right after the headbangers. So Pillman pokes his head through the curtain and he's, he's shaking his head. No, I'm not going to do it. And then Sarge gives him the big shove. And there's Pillman in a dress out in the ramp. So he comes out to wrestle Bob Holly. However many three or 4,000 fans from that building all calling Pillman a very nasty word you were not here on television in 2016. I think they were calling him Bob Saget. <laughs> Perhaps they've misunderstood. Yeah. So, yes, uh, Holly yanked up Pillman's dress to reveal Pillman was wearing a, wearing a very tight silver thong. And he gave Pillman a spanking. He missed the Alabama jam. So Pillman goes out to yell at Goldust and Marlena who were taunting him with a bra. And he did get counted out and has to wear the dress again next week. Cool. Craig I have was, nothing to say. Craig was not a fan of the thong. I did note uh, when this show began, they put up the sexual content disclaimer. And now you know why. That's true. For Pillman. Pretty soon my son's not going to be able to watch with me. No. <laughs> Dude, he shouldn't be watching now. After the break, Vince and Brett were bickering about Brett joining the announce desk. Slaughter appeared and gave Brett his blessing. Main event, do love taking Austin's place to wrestle Owen Hart. Dude, remember earlier what I was saying about Bret Hart? Brett's doing commentary. And the match here is dude love versus Owen Hart, and so it's a combination of good wrestling and fully doing stupid shit. One of the things he does is Owen is laid out on the ramp and Dude Love goes running and he's going to do a jumping, flying boogie elbow. And he misses and he crashes on the ramp. And Bret Hart on commentary says, stupid. <laughs> Fucking. I laughed so hard. <laughs> Bret Hart is always serious. Yes. This is the same man. He landed on that arm he had a cage match the night before with Hunter, and the whole side of his right arm is just black and blue. Yeah. And then Owen grabs Foley, and he lifts him up and holds him there and slams him. And Jerry Lawler goes, wow, how strong is Owen Hart? And Brett says, he's almost as strong as me. <laughs> Can we have Brett do air commentary in all of these fucking shows? <laughs> Brett was the best. God, he was so great. Vince is kneeling him at his title win, how he's not a deserving champion. What move did you use, Brett? How did you out-wrestle The Undertaker? And I didn't remember much about this show, I'll be honest. I remembered Sean's promo. I forgot about the headbangers and all that. But I remember Brett saying, I outmaneuvered him. <laughs> ah. He's so great. He's so smart. He's the best there is, was, and ever will be. I also like they showed Steve Austin watching backstage in this giant monitor with an itty-bitty little picture worse than your smartphone. So, eventually, through a lot of comedy, Owen gets dude in the sharpshooter. Oh, Brett, Brett interferes. I should mention this. Bulldog comes out. This distracts Slaughter and the ref. So, Brett takes advantage and posts dude and throws him into the ring. So, Owen locks dude in the sharpshooter, and out comes Steve Austin. He bypasses the ring. He goes over to yell at Brett. Brett's looking back at him. Everyone goes to separate them. And somewhere in here, Austin gets his hands on a slammy. And everyone, for just a second, turns their attention away from Austin and towards Brett. And Austin turns tur turn towards the ring, where Owen Hart's poking his head through the ropes. And Steve Austin looks up at the guy who dropped him on his head 24 hours earlier and nearly killed him. And he hit him so fucking hard in the head with the slammy. <laughs> Owen goes down. The dude pins him. Austin leaves. As dude is celebrating in the ring, they had women with the dude love tattoo painted on their chests. They hit the ring afterwards to give him lap dances. Meanwhile, Brett's checking on Owen. 
Blood pouring out the back of his head. <laughs> Austin clobbered him. And that was that. <laughs> Old school, baby. Got to get that receipt. Apparently. Yeah, that was a pretty good show. That was a very good show. That's even better going back over it. Now they got Screw the headbangers, slaughtered <laughs> by Nitro as always. I don't know if they've seen this news at the time, but it seems like every week we're here saying another big week. Yeah. We were fresh off a Shawn Michaels heel turn and Lex Luger's championship win. And somehow we had big news on both shows again this week. That's right. Don't get too used to it, though. This is a very newsworthy year. That's true. And I think most of what we'll be talking about in 98 and 99 is how much shit sucked that in is... WCW. And how great it was in WWE. Yeah. That'll be the story. But yeah, we got those shows to talk about here today. And I have got a song. Well, it's about time. Oh, it's about time, all right. Wait till you hear this one. Well, let's get started on Raw. Raw number 222. August 11th, 1997. The pre-show hype video is recapping Shawn Michaels' heel turn last week. He got a scathing promo on Bret Hart, and then Jim Ross is doing the voiceover, and he says, Is all quiet in the front, or is all hell about to break loose? Very dramatic. The latter. <laughs> the answer is definitively the latter. So Shawn comes out for a promo. He still has lots of fans, and he is angrily slapping their hands on his way down to the ring, which I didn't know was possible, but he was. He says the WWF asked him to do a job at SummerSlam, and when things went haywire, they wanted to throw the controversy in his lap, but he'd had plenty in his lap before. Early crotch chop here. Yes, yes. Vince is on commentary, said Sean asked to be the ref. And Sean said he learned he had a match against Mankind tonight on Raw. He learned this while on his couch watching superstars on TV because Vince didn't have the guts to call him on the phone and tell him. Funny how things just haven't changed. <laughs> Back then, you had to watch the wrestling show, though, to find out what was going on on Raw. Yes. Now you've just got to be on your own Twitter. Yes. So the fans were calling Sean gay. He said, ask your mamas and your sisters if I'm gay. They cheered. They cheered. Yeah. <laughs> you fucked our family. <laughs> gay! <laughs> That's what they were doing. Yeah. You're not wrong. No. It's factually accurate. He vowed to beat Mankind tonight, and then, Brian, he did your favorite MMA math. Since Mankind beat Taker, if I beat Mankind, that'll prove I'm better than Taker. That's right. Yes. He started addressing Sergeant Slaughter. Said no one was going to steal his spotlight. He wanted it all. And Vince notes, I know that's right. So out comes Sarge. <sighs> <laughs> yes, Brian? It's just amazing we talked a couple of weeks ago about how every backstage interview geek has to look exactly the same. They look like a young Vince McMahon. They're normal-looking brunette, normal average guys. They look exactly like Vince when he was young doing this job. Without the pompadour. Sure. Every authority figure, except for his daughter, that Vince has has to be mildly incompetent. Slaughter is out there just bumbling his way through these lines. He's Teddy Long. He's Vicky Guerrero. He's Mike Adam Lee. The list goes on and on. They've got to always just have some guy. You know who he was? He was actually J.J. Dillon on the other show. Yes, actually, that's the best one yet. <laughs> that's what he was. Which is ironic because last week you praised Sergeant Slaughter. I did? What did I role. say? You're talking about how he was. Oh, that's right. Figure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, I, I praise the fact that he he didn't get stomped all over, but he, this fucker could not deliver a line to save his life. Wow. He couldn't. So Sean's trying to get in his face, but then every time Sarge speaks, Sean sells the spittle, and finally Sean says, "No one's gonna talk to me like that. I feel like my life is in danger. I need an insurance policy, a big insurance policy." And he suggest, you know, he implied it might be a new giant like Diesel or Sid, his former bodyguards. I think we were supposed to think that he was talking about Nash. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be. Anybody else fast forward in your head when Sean was selling, getting spit on to when Hunter and Sean put the face shields on with the wiper? Yes. Just a few months away. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's foreshadowing. It's a slow build to that joke. So his music played, he danced again, and it was fun. A lot of slow builds on this show. 
up and down the show, there's one slow build after another. Which is interesting because I don't think Sarge meant to spit all over the guy. It's just how he talks. But he spat all over him every time they talked. And of course, Sean had to be right in his face, so it's half Sean's fault. Like the refereeing gig. Maybe if you have an abnormally large chin, maybe it makes it so you spit a lot. I don't think that's the problem. I think he's just a spitter. <laughs> One way or the other, he couldn't deliver a line. He's a spitter, Vinny. We had footage of Biloxi fans picking a winner in the Michaels Mankind match. By the way, the dental work on these people. Whew. I've done my rant on how the wrestling fans they pick for these segments never reflect well in the sport, except there was a very one very wise young man who said, Shawn Michaels is going to win because he's the greatest of all time. <laughs> hey, I can't argue with that. The Legion of Doom was whipping steel drums backstage in preparation for their country weapon match against the Godwins. Then Hawk stopped to squeal like a piggy into the camera. Did a good job. I hope he's not threatening what I think he's threatening. Turns out he wasn't. So we got Hawk versus Henry Godwin in a country whip whipping match. Hawk versus Hog. Yeah. In what was described as the first ever country whipping match. And of course, Hog had to claim, where I come from, this is how we settle disputes. Yes. In 1997. That's right. I was like, oh yeah? Wow. So each guy had a strap. And it was essentially a one-on-one -on -one battle royal. With the idea of being you whipped each other and whoever couldn't take it first had to run away. Had to flee the ring. Yeah. Whoever's feet touched the floor lost. Yes. So they did what they could, but there's only so much you can do with a strap. You can whip a guy with it. And apparently it's not much. You know what? No. Honest to God, given that it was Hawk mm -hmm. versus Hog mm -hmm. in a singles match, it was fine. It was fine. They'd they would have had a much worse wrestling match. I'm certain. <laughs> You have a point there. All they had to do was strap each other. They yeah. had to do no holds. No. There was like one strap-assisted clothesline yeah. and a bunch of whipping. Yeah. Fine. That's what they did. Owen and Davey Boy are out on commentary arguing about which one of them would get to face the Patriot later. Also hyping up a four-way tag title match at Ground Zero. So this went about four or five minutes, and Phineas bonked Animal with a slop bucket. A four-way brawl broke out, and Animal clotheslined Henry out of the ring, so Hawk won. Yeah. So it was dumb. It was a boring match with a dumb finish, and in the end, the result didn't matter because both teams were in the four-way anyway. Why can't you have a DQ in a country whipping match? <laughs> you don't want to ruin the finish of a man landing on the ground? I don't know. I... Was it TNA that had the strap match where the fans had the straps? Yes. That was dumb. I'll tell you it was dumb. In this match, Phineas wax animal and then Animal gets in the ring and they do the finish. So Phineas grabs, it was either Phineas or Henry, it doesn't matter. One of them grabs the strap and they wrap it around Hawk's neck. And they do an over-the-shoulder backbreaker, except they're, they're hanging the guy by his neck. Now, for those of you that have never wrestled, I, I do not even have to explain this, you should know. If you're going to hang a guy... He grabs the strap with two hands like he's trying to protect his neck. But in reality, he's preventing himself from being hung. Or if you're going to throw somebody by the hair, you grab the person's wrist. So actually you're holding onto their wrist and they're not really pulling your hair out. Fucking Hawk is hanging by his neck. He did not grab the strap. His hands are down by his sides. And he was literally, swear to God, being hung by his neck by this man. And he hung there for like... Three seconds and then start squirming. Like he suddenly realized, holy fuck, I'm dying. And he got out of there. Maybe he wasn't in a proper state of mind. Mm. It's been known to happen. Yeah. They showed Slaughter presenting Brian Pillman with tonight's dress earlier in the day. This was so old school and so great. It was just Slaughter going, Pillman, you got to wear this. And Pillman goes, I'm not going to wear it. And Slaughter goes, yeah, you are. And Pillman goes, damn it, and goes back into his office. That was a whole segment. Uh, yes, it was. He did threaten to fire him, so. Sure. Yeah. Scott Putsky versus Tony Williams. What I loved about it was Pillman knows the rules. Mm -hmm. Sure. But he was still going to argue. Sure. Because as a heel, he thought, maybe this week. <laughs> you going to pull one over on him? If I say <laughs> no, he'll, he'll say, all right. He'll bend to my will. Sure. Yeah. 
So this match here was a backdrop just for Goldust and Marlena to come out and air hidden camera footage of Brian Pillman's locker room as he threw a tantrum and then undressed and put the dress on. Okay, a couple things. First off, remember this when WWE actually debuts their new cruiserweight division. This company had just debuted the light heavyweight title, or the light heavyweight division. Mm -hmm. They did it because these cruiserweight matches were killing it on Nitro. Right. And this is what they fucking did. Yeah. When you say they did a split screen... No, no. Two-thirds of the screen was Brian Pillman in his underwear. One-third of the screen was the wrestling match. And Vince McMahon, on no fewer than two occasions, and maybe more, kept telling us, on the right-hand side of your screen is the match. Like, maybe you'd be confused and think the guy in his underwear was the match. Well, he was wrestling with the dress. Pillman... Pretending he could not figure out how to put this dress on was more entertaining than the match. Oh, yeah. They didn't even go back to a full screen for the finish. No. Yeah, are they trying to get Scott Putsky over or not? Clearly not, if you watch this. There was a point here where Putsky tried a German suplex and dropped poor Mr. Williams right on top of his head. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even the most brutal suplex of the night. No, it was not. So... They're, scre they're go all having a cow about this Pillman footage. Lawler says, this is against the law. Golda says, no, it's not. <laughs> Lesson for everyone. <laughs> this is very much against the law. Now that it's actually very important now that every four-year-old has a camera on his phone. Don't do this. Very much against the law. So Pillman strips to his underwear and Ross says, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> we got a lot of slapstick comedy of Pillman fighting the dress, trying to put it on. Putsky won with a Polish hammer. Vince apologized to the wrestlers for focusing on the other screen. Oh, Sar yeah. He was so sad. <laughs> Sarge came out and ordered Goldust and Marlena to the back. And the best part was they aired the video later. Right. On the big screen. Yes. We were, didn't have to ruin the match for this. No. If you were watching this. I had this, thought about that, but you're right. If you were watching this on your iPad or, God forbid, your phone, you wouldn't have seen the match. It was impossible. Yeah. God, and... <laughs> Anyway, I'm not wasting any more time on this because there's more to come. This Scott Putsky, Tony Williams match doesn't deserve any more commentary. Undertaker did a backstage promo promising to watch Michaels and Mankind later. I mean, what a dick Goldust was. <laughs> there's a light heavyweight match going on, but fuck it. Now's a great time to show my new video. Mm -hmm. Flash Funk versus Brian Pillman. I did really like this. They plugged Jerry Lawler's match against Tommy Dreamer on ECW's Hardcore Heaven 97 that weekend. The only other name they mentioned was Sabu, who I believe was the champion, if I recall correctly. So. <laughs> Can we talk about Slaughter again? Slaughter came back out. He rules at the Patriot. No, he was on the screen. I'm oh, sorry, he was on the screen, yes. He rules at Patriot, will wrestle Owen and Bulldog. Yes. With the Patriot getting to choose his partner. And Vince wants to know who the partner is, and Sarge bumbled through the line. How about that, 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 you'll find out tonight. You're not a fan of Sergeant No, Slaughter. he's horrible. Just praised him last week. I praised his attitude, but his delivery is bad. So they're doing this match, and Funk misses a moonsault, and Pillman hits a DDT. But before he can make the cover, Goldust and Marlena return to the stage. Again. The announcers were flabbergasted that someone would come out and distract their opponent. <laughs> <That's> revolutionary. <laughs> So, they show the spy cam footage. Pillman lost his mind, and Funk pinned him with a small package. So Pillman has to wear the dress again next week. Which, of course, the key is, it was a small package, so his dress came up, and he mooned the camera. Much bigger underwear than last week. Yeah, yeah. I'm not complaining. This angle is perfect. Well, sure. The, 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 the bad guy who gets fucked into losses every week and has to keep wearing the dress every week. It, it's so simple. But now, this was obviously setting up the big match... Where if Pillman won, he would get Marlena. Yeah. We'll never know what happened because then he died. No, I think he won that match first. That's right. No? There, I remember a promo from a hotel room with Pillman and Marlena together. Actually, you may be right. We'll That's see. Right. We'll see. But unfortunately, yes, Brian Pillman did pass away before the end of 97. Well, it was the pay-per-view. It was Bad Blood, yes. Same day. Uh, they Speaking of death, they recap Steve Austin nearly dying at SummerSlam. And then waffling Owen Hart with a slammy last week. 
You know what's amazing about it is Owen was really good, but this was 100% his fault. Yeah. He just pile drove the guy in his fucking head. Yes. I, I look at this and I think, I don't know what Austin could have done any differently. Nothing. Yeah. Like, what in the hell was he thinking? What was going through Owen's mind? How did he think this would work? And I don't have an answer to that. Dude Love comes out for a promo. Okay, I love Mick Foley. Always have. And uh, I mentioned I was out of town for the retro episode where he did the Dude Love debut, but I remember it being great, and you guys assured me it was still great 20 years later. That's correct. Is it just me, or did this gimmick have a very short shelf life in hindsight? Well, when I watched this, I did not think that it was dead quite yet. I did think that if anyone else in the world had been given this, it would have totally died. That's probably mm -hmm. true. But Foley was so goddamn good that he made it work for a while. But yes, this was not as successful as Cactus Jack and or Mankind. <laughs> and or Mick Foley. I, I, my, my memory from 20 years ago was that Dude Love was awesome. And I think my really real memory or the real fact is Dude Love was awesome once. Then it got old. Didn't he wrestle as all three characters in a rumble one time? Yes. Was that the following year? Uh, might be a year or two because he, he <laughs> did the bit as he'll do love feuding with Austin too. Oh, yeah, I, forget, yeah. I forget exactly how this all went down. Uh, let's see. So dude comes out. He promises his tag team partner Steve Austin will be back in action soon. They talked about the four-way tag title match, the first of its kind in WWF history. He promised the mankind would take out that wannabe hippie Shawn Michaels. And he's going on. He's saying he's ending every sentence with daddy and baby and just really overdoing it. And it's very, very terrible. And Sean appears on the big screen, as sick of this as I am. Says, dude, you Nimrod. You're not me. You're not even you. You idiot. <laughs> not a stupid idiot. I could have cut this promo. I think about this. <laughs> just an idiot. He vowed to kick either mankind's or dude's ass later, whichever showed up. And he disappeared. And dude quoted John Lennon, did some terrible dancing. The groupies hit the ring and he danced with them. Oh, listen. <laughs> There's a lot worse coming. All right. And they showed Patriot talking to his mystery partner backstage. All we saw was this fella had slicked back hair. So we got the Bulldog and Owen Hart versus Patriot and a mystery partner, and it was Ken Shamrock. Brett is shown walking back, uh, watching backstage. Yes. I presume Brett, because you only see his greasy hair. Because... He never turns his back to it. They didn't force the guy. You see, it is impossible... To film a guy watching TV, where you see both the TV he's watching and his face, mm -hmm. unless he's in a completely preposterous position. I don't know if they wanted Brett to do that, and he just said, fuck you, if I'm watching TV, I'm going to watch TV. But literally, you couldn't see Brett, you could only see his hair. Was there, like, a problem with this? Did they get letters? My child could not figure out who was watching TV. Could you turn the man around next time? <laughs> what was it where Kevin Dunn decided... We must have everyone totally facing the camera at all times, no matter how completely uncomfortable and ridiculous they look. Because it hadn't started yet. So it was a great moment before the match. First of all, I did not realize how tall the Patriot was. Like, they're six foot six out here. I didn't realize how over the Patriot was. Yeah. Well, they're in Mississippi. He has this, moments. This crowd, I was noticing this. these two shows tonight. The Raw crowd was rabid. The WCW crowd, not so much. Really? I thought the WCW crowd was on fire all night. Yeah. So my favorite part of this whole match is they do the intros. Shamrock's the mystery partner. He gets cheers. And the two teams go to their respective corners. And they're, the bell's about to ring. And they're doing the preparations. And Patriot and Shamrock do the, the big manly baby face handshake and arm pat. You know? Like, we got this, brother. Go ahead. And then both guys step through the ropes to the apron. <laughs> and they look at each other, and Shamrock steps back in. I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. So they're doing a very fun tag match. I will say one disappointing thing, and that is that Owen was an amateur, and Shamrock was a UFC star. Mm -hmm. I thought, man, these guys could have some fun out there. And then, they just did pro wrestling. They did amateur stuff for like a minute. Maybe. And then there was like one fireman's carry and that cool hip flock reversal Shane Rock did. But yes, other than that, it was just straight pro wrestling. Sad. They, they did take Shane Rock and make him just a guy very quickly. It's kind of astounding. Kind of not, but kind of. Anyway, 
Uh, Vince warned fans that if you buy the pay-per-view from England next week, uh, next month, British Bulldog will be cheered. Yeah, he was. You don't say. <laughs> the British Bulldog will be popular in Britain. You know who wasn't cheered on that show? Sean. Sean Michaels. I believe he was not. So Brett comes out to watch. Uh, then later he tried to come down to ringside, but Slaughter stops him. But the still distracted Shamrock. Owen slips a chair into the ring. Then he distracts Shamrock and the ref. Bulldog goes to grab the chair, but Patriot grabs him, hits a full Nelson slam on the chair, and the ref returns to count the pin. And the place went nuts. Yes. So the, the heels got their just desserts. They tried to cheat, and it backfired on them. And the 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 All-American hero won. The Canadians got screwed. All is right with the world. And the Patriot got a big win over a heart. Because mm -hmm. he is getting a championship match at the next pay-per-view. He, he pinned the European champion. His whole goal is to prove that he belongs, yes. as he noted later. This is great. When Shamrock was coming down to the ring, I couldn't help but notice that he looks more and more like an action figure every week that he's on television. Maybe. What do you mean, maybe? When he first showed up... Go back and look at his mania appearance. He was exploding. He was two He-Mans. Okay. I think he's a he's just slightly smaller now. He does look like an action figure. Yeah, you're, but it's not starting. Okay. Yeah. No, you got to go back. I think he's been on the uh, same training regimen as Scott Steiner. Clearly, you have not read his book Inside the Lion's Den, hmm. where he speaks out against the usage of steroids. Oh, you would not lie. I didn't say anything. I said Scott Steiner's regimen. I didn't say anything about steroids. He has failed several tests. So. <laughs> They showed some of the coverage they were getting in Canadian papers for the U.S.-Canada feud. Got a montage of Canadian fans talking about how much they love their champion or their national hero. And then Brett gets to the airport. He has taken the red eye home after Raw, two days after winning the world title. Gets to the airport early in the morning. 1,500 fans there to greet him. And then he finally finds a quiet place and cuts a promo about how he's carrying the belt with honor for his fans in Canada and Europe and the Middle East, all over the world. Those are the people I wear this belt for, he says. Those are the people that made him refuse to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels. And I wrote Calgary, but it's Montreal, of course. Well, you know. Yeah. Talk Sh about my main man, the Patriot. Shawn very quickly was talking to his insurance policy, but he chased the camera away. And then the Patriot did a backstage promo. He said he had proved he belonged in he had proved he belonged in this company, yes. And he had proven Brett was beatable. He was going on when Brett jumped him from behind with a chair and put the boots to him. Patriot's my man. How so? He's awesome. <laughs> He's the baby facest baby face you ever saw. I'm pretty sure that he retired after he tore his triceps like three times. That sounds familiar. He made also when, but on Shamrock's training program, I believe. Sure. Yeah. I remember, I think, I, I didn't look this up, but I remember that Batista also tore his triceps numerous times. Right. And everybody thought he was going to have to retire because this is what ended the Patriots career. But Batista has a better doctor, I guess, and he came back. But it's too bad because this fucking patriot, he was a great baby face. Is uh, Mr. Wilkes still with us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you get him on the show sometime? Maybe I will. Maybe on the 4th of July. Hey. <laughs> you should. Next year, I'll no, shoot for that. Better yet, Flag Day. Hey. Mm. Farouk versus Chains. Because he's a fan of all flags. He said that. Can we talk about how awful... <laughs> Was yeah. Chains the worst wrestler of all time in this match, or was it just me? No, dude. Chains was bad, but fuck, have you seen Crush? Uh, They're both terrible. This fact, match. I, DOA may have been it's, the worst group of actual professional wrestlers you, ever put together in one just like a, group. What they could do bell to bell. There mm -hmm. have been other certainly worse booked factions. And there's been others that had were less intimidating or had a worse look or whatever. But as far as actually wrestling matches... The Harris Twins, Crush, and Brian Lee. Had to be the worst. Who was the best in that group? Fuck. You are not allowed to say Brian Lee after this match. <laughs> it's definitely not fucking Brian Lee. Shitty match, shitty finish. I had, the only good thing about this was that The Rock was born. The Rock yeah. was, in fact, born here. I, I, I must talk more about how bad Brian Lee sucks. Mm. We've all seen the spot. It's very simple. Babyface is on his hands and knees. The... 
bad guy is standing over him, and he jumps and he drops his ass in the baby face's back. Mm-hmm. He does this two or three times, well, two times, and the third time, the baby face turns over and dr- lifts his knees up, and the baby face or the heel gets nutted in mid jump. Yeah. Yep. That didn't happen. Farouk tried so hard to get Brian Lee to do this, and he never got close to getting it right. Yeah, because as he was doing it. Brian Lee decides to drop to his belly and then roll over. And then Farouk is now standing over him. Yeah. And so what does Farouk do? Well, I guess I'll jump. <laughs> like a moron. Yeah. And then Farouk tried to dodge an elbow smash, but Brian Lee was like, no, no, I'm hitting you with this fucker. And he adjusted in midair to make sure he hit Farouk with his elbow. Then they both lie there because they didn't know what to do. So this atrocious match ends. <laughs> the ref gets bumped. Rocky Maivia runs in. He is stealing Shawn Michaels' pleated shorts and loafers look. And he plants chains with a rock bottom. Farouk gets the win. And Farouk beckons Rock into the ring. And he stands beside him and gives the nation salute. Total 180 for The Rock. As a bad guy. He was much more poised. He had a better fucking haircut. <laughs> It's amazing that The Rock... <laughs> he turned evil, his hair changed. <laughs> yeah, The Rock and DX were both born on the same show. Actually, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. And then a gang war broke out backstage. Backstage, the nation was welcoming, welcoming Rocky into the fold. They kicked the cameraman out of the room. DOA comes running up with weapons, trying to break their way in until Sarge and other geeks break it all up. Sable came out to be hot in a cat suit on TV. She succeeded. They announced she was there to be a guest ring announcer, but that is secondary to her primary role of being hot in a catsuit on TV. Before she could even announce anyone, Patriot hits the ring. He says, I can take any man face-to-face one-on-one. There's not much I can do when I get jumped with a chair and hit in the head with a chair from behind. So, Brett, if you're a real man, you'll come fight me face-to-face right now. God, he was great. (laughs) I love the Patriot. (laughs) A great, fiery, baby face promo. And the place went crazy here in Biloxi, Mississippi. That's right. So Brett obliges, a brawl breaks out, and very quickly the hearts hit the ring and swarm the Patriot. They lay him out. They bury him in the Canadian flag. What was great about this is during the brawl, they note that Slaughter was busy backstage dealing with the brawl between the nation and the DOA. So they actually wow. had an explanation for why it took so long for the security to get out there. Crazy. Eventually, they led the hearts away. Mankind did a backstage promo about Sean's insurance pal- policy. He promised that the lump in Sean's throat would later be... He, the lump in Sean's throat later would be his liver. Can't believe you skipped over Brackus's promo. That's next. It is? Mm-hmm. So it says in my notes. Mine Watch too. this on a time machine, apparently. Brackus does his promo. He's growling. He's angry. There's scary music playing. And the only words in English I understood was Vader's name. He's calling well, it, out all the heels. You know, when you look like that, Vinny, you're a baby face. I guess so. Vince McMahon. <laughs> I guess so. Shawn Michaels of Mankind. Why in the world did these men not have more matches? They were fucking unbelievable. It's the best thing I watched all week. Not me. No, nah, yeah, I watched, this is not as good as Okada and... Uh, well, I haven't seen that. So I'm not talking about that. Talk about that goddamn tag match on Nitro. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that was, was great in a too. different way. <laughs> really? They were both pretty fucking hardcore. <laughs> Actually, that's, that, that is true and a good point, because I mentioned earlier that young fan astutely knows that Shawn Michaels is the greatest of all time, but Foley is the only guy who could drag this type of match out of Shawn Michaels. An ugly fight. And this was a great, 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 ugly fight. Guest starring the most unbreakable table in the history of the world. (laughs) I don't know where they got this table. Dude, not only was it unbreakable, they didn't bother clearing it off. No. No. There's fucking monitors and metal boxes. They didn't give a shit. So they're doing backdrops onto this table. Mankind's behind the table. And Sean does an elbow where his body lands on the table, but his elbow lands on Mankind. I don't know if they thought the table would break or not, but it didn't didn't even bend. <laughs> this slab of granite out here. So they're outside brawling, and Sean starts ramming Mankind's head into the post, and Ross is screaming, Concussion City! 
Then Hunter Hearst, Helmsley, and China come out. Sean is now, and they go to break and come back. Sean has now removed the mankind mask and is almost doing like puppetry with it, playing jokes, and the fight just keeps on going. Mankind slowly morphs into Cactus Jack and is doing bang, bang and making his big comeback. And then out comes the insurance policy and his big return to the company after I don't know how many years away, ravishing Rick Rude. Saunters down a ringside in a suit. China takes the ref. Hunter trips Mankind. And as Mankind goes after Hunter, Rude waffles him with a chair. Sean follows the super kick for the win, for the win. All the women and children still cheering for Sean. And Ross goes off on another line. Mankind must have had a concussion. It's quite possible Mankind had a concussion here. He got drilled with that chair. Yeah. Good old Rick Rude. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> knowing Mick Foley, he may have told him, lay it in there, brother. It's true. And I like Mick Foley had to tell somebody to lay it in. Hell yeah. So Sean is celebrating his win when Taker's dong went off. And the dead man appeared on the ramp. Sean made sure Hunter and Rude were there to fight beside him. Before Taker could hit ringside, Paul Bear appears on the screen and says, Kane's coming! Kane's coming! Taker, you will burn in hell! And the lights go red and fire shoots up from the stage and they immediately cut off and cut off the air. So that's it. DX just formed. They were not named. They didn't do much together. But this unit is, in fact, the first incarnation of Degeneration X. Actually, at the time, the name was going to be the Click. Later on in that um, on that pay per view from Europe, where Sean wrestled the Bulldog, they were teasing, calling themselves the Triple Threat. That's China right, China and Hunter. Mm, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think. Well, we'll find out. I do remember Slaughter calling them degenerates, mm-hmm. and that right. may have been where everything began. So yeah. was was Rude in the company like a month? He was there for a while. He left he, after Survivor Series. He ended up on okay. both shows yeah, at the right. same time. Right. Yes. I thought this match was so great. This match was awesome. You should all go out of your way to watch it. Absolutely. God, it was just clear the fucking table off. But you know what's funny is like, when I see him clear the table off nowadays, it's kind of like, if this were real, yeah. why would you clear the table off? But then, as a human being, <laughs> I see him not clearing it off, and I'm like, you two shitheads, clear the fucking table off before you get killed. I don't know if it was the first table spot I ever saw. It was one of the first. When Diesel jackknifed Sean through a table. Yes. And did not clear the table. And shit went flying. Yeah. The monitors went flying into the air and came out on Sean's ribs. That's yeah. true. Oh, like my God. Like that spot where I set up all those things to get power bumps. I thought three yes, layers. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> everything fell on me. As usual, Brian, you are exactly like Sean Michael. You know, I really am. Hmm. The other thing I got to say is, you got to think about this. So, even though some of these monitors and these little boxes, Rick Rude here, do you know why Rick Rude originally retired? Uh, his back got hurt. That's right, because he was doing a spot and he like got sandwiched on the ramp it's, uh, by Sting, Sting in Japan. Sting hit him with a tope. This, I only just saw this recently, is how I know. Sting hits him with a tope, and the ring was actually set up on a platform, mm. and Sting's weight landed on Rude, and Rude's back hit the edge of the platform, very much like Sean hitting the casket. That's right. Yes. Bulldog almost died because he got slammed into the trap, trap door, door yeah. that the Ultimate Warrior was supposed to come out of. A fucking trap door mm-hmm. nearly killed the guy. Shawn Michaels broke his back, barely touching. If you rewind it and watch yeah. it, he barely touched the edge of that casket. That's why I see these guys nowadays doing all these body slams on the edge of ladders. Yeah. And it's like, dude, one of these days, one of you guys ain't going to get up. Because this has happened before in wrestling. You can't fucking land on the edge of stuff. Including monitors. They play a song. Raw number 223, August 18th, 1997. That reminds me. <laughs> Next two weeks, preempted for the US Open Tennis Tournament. And so I'm thinking that we'll watch Nitro. And instead of Raw, maybe a couple of the... Old school primetime wrestling. Why don't we watch something that's the same week? As what do you mean the same week? As that Nitro? Yeah. Is that what options do we have? Yeah. What else is there? ECW. I don't really care. Whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> the only thing I will say. All I know is every time we watch that old ECW, we're gravely disappointed. Which, by the way, I'm going to talk about when we talk about Stevie Richards. But go ahead. <laughs> ahead. I was going to say I don't think it, was this the go home show to Ground Zero? Yeah. Okay, I have actually never seen that particular Sean Undertaker match. 
Oh, really? So I may watch it just for my own benefit. I invite you to join me. It is not as good as Hell in a Cell. I believe you. But I'm sure it's better than 95% of all matches I've seen in my life. And 95% of the matches we've seen this year alone. Yes. Yes. Except everything so in the we, G1. Next week we review Ground Zero and Nitro. I was we just, could do that, I was, gonna, I was just going to do the main event. Is it a two-hour show? Ground Zero is a two-hour pay-per-view. Should be, yeah. All right. Okay, we'll watch we do that. Ground Zero and Nitro next week. All right, cool. Done. All right. So this here Raw, which I will say again, 223, August 18th, 1997. Back in the day, they encouraged every fan to bring all the signs you could carry. Signs. Dude, it was different here today. It was. They, they, <laughs> there were so many signs. They were blocking the hard camera. They were blocking... And, and as, as someone who went to many shows in this era, I can tell you, they were blocking the view of the people behind you. Science sucked. Dude, it's not only that, but like the hard camera, across from the hard camera, there were 9 million signs. And then on the same side as the hard camera, there were 9 million signs. And yeah, so in front of the hard camera. In between all of this cardboard, you could kind of see Vince. Yeah. They must have ran out of a poster board in Atlantic City. And I will add, they were zooming in on, tight on some very non-PG signs. Did you see the one that said LWO? I saw that one. LWO has not debuted They yet. predicted the future. God damn it, a time traveler. <laughs> People keep seeing these. I think somebody saw uh, someone like a, a time traveler in a Tyson fight. I forget. Oh, yeah, hmm. yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe the sign said, he's not the hitman, he's the shit man. Oh. He zoomed way in on that. So Vince in the sea of cardboard brings out Rick Rude for a promo. It was quite strange watching Ravishing Rick come out in his suit... On the Raw is War set with his old stripper music playing. Rick Rude was not under contract. Rick Rude As had we would learn. debuted a couple of weeks earlier. And they put him with Sean. And of course, this was Sean's heyday. Sean did not want Rick Rude. And so... We all know where this goes. Oh, yes, we do. It did not end well. No. So... Sean's out, or Vince is out there asking, essentially, whose side are you on? Who's paying your bills? Who, who's, uh, you know, who, who are you working for? Vince does not sound bored enough right now. Vince, they, me? you, <laughs> okay, yeah. they wanted to know what he was doing. Rude said, "If you pay the price, you'll get the right amount of insurance." I'm an insurance salesman. They repeated this ten times. Mm -hmm. And finally, Rude just goes, hit my music yeah. to end this segment. The, the, the gimmick was he kept uh, copying famous insurance company catchphrases. Right. You're in good hands with Rick Rude. You need a piece of Rick Rude. And all I can think of was somebody backstage, which I thought these were really, really clever. What it was was really, really boring. To end the whole thing, he said, if you got the bucks, I got the bang. Yeah. Cool. What does that so mean? anyway, I didn't think of this until now. I did not watch a lot of ECW back in the day. I didn't have access to it for most of the time. But he had been in ECW tormenting Shane Douglas, and I think they ended up on the same side. But anyway, he's out there cursing, making very lewd innuendos about Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff and what they might be doing together. It was all wild and crazy, and he shows up in WWE, and he's just lame. Vince liked him because they had the same hair. I guess. Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith got a quick backstage promo on the Legion of Doom. They showed the silhouette of Shawn Michaels and the silhouette of Sergeant Slaughter shouting at each other in near total darkness. Lighting on the show was not good. Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith versus Legion of Doom. They had a... I'm just amazed watching these old shows. It's so funny watching them both because Raw, a couple of things they do are really, really great. And the rest of the show is so horrible. Owen and Bulldog versus LOD with the heat on Hawk for five minutes was television death. Death! And then the Hog Farmers run in uh -huh. and they hit Hawk with a pail for the DQ. Could this have oh. been worse? Owen pinned him. Aside but... from the headbangers being involved? That would have done it. So these three teams brawled in the upcoming four-way. The fourth team is the team of love and hate. And they were not there. Mankind did a quick backstage promo. He was teaming tonight with The Undertaker, and he mentioned, of course, they'd been hating each other all year, and he teased he might attack Taker before all is said and done. And Michaels does a backstage promo. 
he is upset about this tag match. The tag match is Taker and Mankind versus Shawn Michaels and Hunter Hearst Helmsley, and, and no one involved wants to be in it is the key. So Shawn sees upset. Vince is throwing him to the Lions with two dangerous opponents and a tag partner he doesn't trust. He warns Shawn, or he warns Vince, if you paint me into a corner, you get what's coming to you. Sonny came out to do ring announcing for the next match. <laughs> this was odd. <laughs> he had a production snafu. I can't even say it was a production snafu because they she announces Flash Funk. Yes. They play Flash Funk's music. Right. It plays, mm -hmm. and then suddenly Brian Christopher just starts walking down to the ring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he gets like three quarters of the way down the ramp, and they stop, and they start playing his music. Well, don't forget, before that, Sonny realized that's not Flash Funk. Yes. And she goes back and corrects herself and says, this is not a man from Philadelphia, this man's from Tennessee. But regardless of whatever she said... They played Flash's music right. after she said Flash. Not to mention Flash Funk's music was playing and Brian Christopher was walking through the curtain. The only thing that I can figure is that right before Flash Funk was supposed to go through the curtain, he had to use the restroom and he <laughs> shoved Brian Christopher <laughs> through the curtain. Like, why else would this happen? I don't know. I'm not even trying to be funny. Why else would this happen? Why did, did Flash Funk just walk through this curtain? I don't know. What did was he notice, doing? Did you notice as Sonny was bounding down to the ring, her pants broke, and she was fiddling with the zipper the whole time? Can't say that I did. I wasn't watching that. Yeah, me neither. So we had a quick promo from Christopher saying he wanted to prove he was the best light heavyweight by stepping up in weight class and beating a heavyweight tonight. And Flash did a promo saying he was no stepping stone. So they did a fun match. Christopher was working him over. Lawler was on commentary demanding a pile driver, and apparently Christopher couldn't hear him, so Lawler left the announce desk to go order this move. <laughs> Let's think about that, by the way. <laughs> he left the announce booth because he had to run over and scream, pile driver. Hit him with a mm -hmm. pile driver. It was he, does very the, he does the important. hand gesture as well. Yes, it was very important to Lawler yeah. that Brian Christopher execute a pile driver. So this distracted Christopher, and Funk shook the ropes to crotch him and hit a 450 splash and won. <laughs> the crotching was hysterical because he hit the ropes and then 1001 1002 <laughs> yes. and then he jumps the opposite direction of the <laughs> of the uh of where flash funk hit the ropes and he crotches himself it wasn't as bad as the wall the machine the, the machine in dallas page nothing will ever be yeah, that okay. bad nothing was that it wasn't that bad but Could we have was... been the wall what was it no i don't think somebody so. else okay anyway i will say yeah. that i love that jerry lawler in storyline was so eager that not only did he leave the announce booth to command a pile driver, but he was commanding a pile driver as Brian Christopher is on the top rope. Yes. Mm -hmm. Climb down, Brian. Climb down and hit a pile driver. Climb down, grab this man, and pile drive him. Taker did a quick backstage promo. He said Sean would not make it to ground zero, and if mankind got in his way, he'd take, he'd take him out too. Ken Shamrock versus the Sultan. Let's discuss what the Sultan was wearing. Sure. Uh, that's what we're here for. He was wearing his getup, but instead of the red and black, this time he wore pink and darker pink. <laughs> so it was pink with darker pink stripes. He looked like a circus tent. Is it possible to put too much bleach into the, the washing machine? I don't think so, Brian. Hmm. All I know is this match bored the hell out of me. As it should. And they took everything that made Ken Shamrock different away from him yeah he was to the point where the shoot fighter won with a hurricane rana yeah that is correct vince mcmahon actually pointed out you know when shamrock does what he does best i don't think he can be beaten he's out there doing running the ropes doing body presses and clotheslines the only shoot fighter thing he did at one point in his comeback after doing a body slam and a clothesline he did hit the belly to belly throwing the big huge sultan way up in the air and then iron sheet jumped in the ring so shamrock suplexed him too and then Shamrock hit a Hurricane Rana and the ankle lock in one. I thought Shamrock looked great here, honestly. Really? Yeah. You know what was amazing about this was, this was 1997, almost 1998. In 2001, there was a WrestleMania show with a gimmick battle royal. They had all of these old gimmicks out there. Yeah. And my official prediction was that the Iron Sheik mm -hmm. was going to win the gimmick battle royal. Because by 2001, I knew there was no way that this guy could take a bump over the top rope. That is correct. Here we were, a mere three years earlier, 
And the Iron Sheik jumps up on the apron. Ken Shamrock drags his ass into the ring, hugs him, and gives him, like, a shoot belly to belly. Yeah. That may have been the last bump the Iron Sheik ever took. I would be stunned if it was not, actually. I was like, this guy's old, dude. <laughs> Shamrock. <laughs> not kill him. Don't care. Well, oh, he was provoked. The Sheik hit him with the flag and I broke see. the pole in house. I will say they show that Hurricane Rana from another angle. And Ken, ja Ken jumps way high in the air. And he gets up there on Sul Sultan's shoulders. And he falls backward. And he falls right on top of his own head. <laughs> at that angle, he did not look as good. Nation of Domination comes out for a promo. Farouk explains why they had taken out Ahmed Johnson. You see, deep down inside... Ahmed wanted to be white, like Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin. But as Farouk explained, he cannot be white if they sandblasted him. That's 20 nice. times. Yeah. He hyped up his street fight against Crush and Savio Vega for What a about while. 30 times? I've never done sandblasting, Brian. <clears throat> I couldn't believe they went right back to this again. Of course they did. Uh, of course they did. Talked about he, he grew up in the street. He was going to bring the street to Crush and Savio. Actually, that part was very good. And then he moved on to Rocky. Rocky Maivia said this young man had come out here trying to do everything the right way, only to learn that wasn't the way to get things done. And then The Rock began to speak. He says he's accomplished a lot in his young days, the youngest intercontinental champion of all time, and all he got was disrespect from the fans chanting, Rocky sucks and die, Rocky die. He repeated several times, this is not about the color of my skin. We are not a racist faction. This is about respect. If you're looking for racism, let's look at the DOA. And he said, the DOA epitomizes racism. I'll just leave that alone. He vowed they would earn respect by any means necessary. Rock was a great promo, if any of you didn't know. He was, he was not the Rock here, but he was not bad. He was greatly improved over the old school Rocky Maivia babyface. Yeah. But still a ways to go. But still better than 90% of the crew. Well, especially better than the guy that spoke next. Crush. Crush. Oh, my God. God bless him. Horrible at everything. He couldn't talk. He couldn't work. He couldn't do anything. He had a lot of friends. He must have been a very nice guy. Yeah, he did have a lot of friends. I'm sure he was a great guy. Buddy always said he was a great guy. Yeah, that's Great true. guys yeah. can be terrible at their job. Yes. Which is the story what are they of Crush. For? Crush appears on the big screen and says, We are not about racism. We are about kicking ass. He dares the nation to come fight them in the parking lot with no commissioner slaughter there to save them. And the nation was so intimidated, they literally left the ring and ran up the ramp to kick their ass. <laughs> Could not wait to go beat up these guys. You know, in 19 years, because today we are looking 19 years back at this show. In 19 years, if we go back and we watch Raw from 2016, there will be no mistaking that these crowds boo and hate Roman Reigns. You know what's funny is all of this talk of die Rocky die and Rocky sucks. I mean maybe there were a lot of pay-per-views that were particularly vociferous that we weren't watching but all of these Raw shows that we have watched that Rocky is on there have not been anything even resembling the reaction that Roman Reigns gets today. No. I mean maybe deep in the background you can hear a couple of guys. I seem to recall one show where it was, he had a split reaction. Sure. But you were correct. It's kind of funny. It's it, like it's, it's, re, it's remembered as this this big time major thing that the fans were chanting, die, Rocky, die. Yeah, and it's a, like, you guys. A huge unanimous backlash. And no, it was not. No. I went to a house show in Tacoma years ago. And one of the sh matches was Mankind against Rocky Maivia. There was a shoot on Rocky, clap, 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 <laughs> shoot on Rocky, clap. And it was very loud. Hmm. Of all the people. Yeah. I guess he's got an amateur background. They showed Goldust, Marlena, and Dakota playing on the beach in Atlantic City. How many video packages in a year are we going to see on this goddamn Goldust character? Not I many more. I've seen a thousand of them. We're approaching the end. Hunter, Hunter did a backstage promo. Started to say he was not afraid of Taker or Mankind, but he did not trust Sean. Suddenly they cut away, basically explaining, this is not an exact quote, but close enough, Sorry, Hunter, we must cut away. There is a race war going on. See, you're missing the key here. He says, I'm not afraid of The Undertaker. I'm not afraid of mankind. And then he says, 
Shawn Michaels does the crime, and I do the time again. Oh, oh I didn't even catch that. Of course not, because it was so dumb. Yeah. I groaned and rolled my eyes. I'm sure that 19 years ago, this was groundbreaking, and people gasped and called the 900 lines to find out if he was shooting. But God, it was lame, looking back. So the nation ran up to brawl with the DOA, and after about five seconds, the Bariquas stole the DOA's motorcycles, and the white guys chased after them. And actually, if you paid attention, they appeared to catch them at the end. <laughs> Puerto Ricans apparently cannot drive motorcycles. Common went through the windshield of Jim Cornette's car. Oh, did he? Yeah. I was not aware. Which begs the question, why did you park your car there, Jim? And if you did on purpose, why did you allow him to take bumps on it? He went through the rear view window, window of the car and was back on offense literally three seconds later. Because I don't think he was supposed to go through the windshield. Yeah. I think he was the... supposed to just take a bump. But when you're big and heavy and you hit the glass, things happen. Real Double J versus Brian Pillman. Pillman comes out there in a dress. And all is going off about how wrong this is. And he stops and says, he does have nice cleavage, though. And Vince has a hearty, hearty laugh at this. So Road Dog's first spot was to do a go-behind and flick Pillman's nipple. And he lifted the dress to show Pillman's underwear. Are we in second grade? So Pillman hits the DDT, but Goldust hits the ring. Drops one elbow on Road Dog and leaves. This makes Road Dog the winner via DQ. That makes Pillman the loser, and so Pillman has to keep wearing a dress. Road Dog, by the way, no problems with taking this violent blow and a cheap win. No, you don't care. Maybe Goldust pulled the pulled the elbow. <laughs> you know what I mean? In storyline, he's a good worker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. That's a new one. So Michael Kolb shows up to interview Goldust, who says Pillman is so pretty in his dress he wanted to see him wear it again next week. Pillman cuts a promo challenging Goldust to one more match. And if Goldust wins, Pillman will leave the company forever. Goldust was cool with that, but Pillman says, if I win, then Marlena will be my personal assistant for 30 days, 24 hours a day. Or, as I call her, Terry. Yes. So Goldust says he'd be out of his mind, put his wife on the line in a match. Pillman started baiting him. Goldust is getting angry, but is still refusing to put his wife on the line. And finally, Pillman claims that Dakota is his love child. And Goldust charges the ring, and Pillman bails. And meanwhile, Marlena grabs Cole's microphone and says, We accept the challenge. Goldust cannot believe this. Asked her why. Pillman's not worth it. It all came off really, really weird, and based on the lack of crowd reaction and what the announcers were saying, I think Cole's microphone was not going over the house mic, and so the crowd had no idea what was going on. All I know is I loved it. I thought in a on a show with so much bad stuff, this is a great angle. And there is no subtlety with Brian Pillman, <laughs> which fits into the loose cannon Tell me character. More. <laughs> He's just blurts out, she's my love child. Ha ha ha. It's crazy, And man. then as Goldust hits the ring, he shouts, it was so good, it was so good. Yeah. That's why they had to show them playing on the beach earlier in the day. I understand that, but my point was, I feel like I've seen 9,000 family videos with Goldust. I see. Like, I get it. He's a family man. He's mm. got a baby. I've seen this a thousand times. I don't talk about my baby as much as these geeks talk about Goldust and his baby. I don't know about that. I don't. Now... Shouldn't Jesse James have been at least a little angry? Yes. Goldust stomped on he his ass. Hit no, no, no. Him. No, no. He pulled that elbow. He is a great worker and he worked the ref. Oh, is that what happened? Absolutely. Oh, I see. Vader cut a backstage promo. He says, Patriot, I'm going to change your colors from red, white, and blue to black and blue. <laughs> yeah. I laughed. And then Patriot comes out wearing red, white, black, and, and black blue. And blue. I thought of that. That's true. So the announcers are doing all they can to paint Patriot as a legit top guy, and God bless him for trying. <laughs> Bret Hart comes out waving the Canadian flag. This distracts Patriot so Vader can jump him from behind. They were sloppy and screwing stuff up left and right. And when they were not screwing stuff up, it was boring and uneventful. What are you talking about? The Patriot pulled Vader's balls into the post. Yeah. Which, if you'll recall, is the same thing that has kept Biggie Langston out of action for a month now. Yes. Same thing happened to Mankind later in the show. He's injured so badly... That he will not be cleared by this coming Sunday. They know in advance his balls will not be healed enough. He's not going to be on SummerSlam? No! Ah, nuts. He's not medically cleared due to a ball injury. Craig, I'm giving you a thumbs up for that one. Thank you. Craig, I heard that one nine times on Raw last night. I know. So the Patriot, 
And by the way, Vader gets pulled balls first in the post, and he's fine. So either he has no balls. This is ridiculous. Or he's got very, very tough balls compared to Biggie Langston. So Vader makes his big comeback, and then Patriot makes his big comeback. And here's why Jim Ross is the best, okay? Jim Ross knew there's no man in the company who is better for me to say the following line during his comeback. The Patriot needs to make hay when the sun shines. That's what he called in the middle of the Patriots comeback. Because he's Southern, you Who see. else would that fit? It ain't gonna fit... <laughs> it doesn't fit him. L-O-D. <laughs> it ain't gonna fit mankind. But you know what? It fits the Patriot. Because <laughs> he's a hick? If any man's gotta make hay when the sun shines, it's the Patriot, Del, Del Wilkes. Wilkes. <laughs> Should've been Delbert Wilkes. And then <laughs> Vader mows the guy over, and then Patriot hits for, I believe, the first time. Mm -hmm. At least on Raw, the Uncle Slam. Ah, I see. No, yes. He's used it before. They just called it that. They called it the Uncle Slam. And the best part is he hits the Uncle Slam. He makes the cover and he hooks the leg. And when he hooks the leg, Vincent K. McMahon screams, He's got the leverage <laughs> as he gets the pin. Why didn't they give him the Patriot missile dropkick? I don't the know. shoulder tackle, he called it the Patriot missile in global. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I'm always amazed when Vince McMahon says something technical like that. Yeah. It always blows my mind. It's been close to 20 years now, at least 15. I still remember when they did Steph versus Vince in the middle of this horrible cartoon gimmick brawl. They go to the finish and Vince is laid out in his belly and Steph has to turn him over and she shoots the half. Yeah. <laughs> She's Brad Ringens. <laughs> yeah. Just crazy. There, there's something about Vince where... I don't know what it is, but you always just kind of think he actually doesn't know anything about wrestling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But he's Vince McMahon. He's of course seen... he understands you cook the leg for leverage. Yes. So Paige gets the win with the Uncle Slam. Brett then moves to ringside. This distracts, or he has a stare down with the Patriot. Then Vader jumps Paige from behind and beats the holy hell out of him. And five minutes ago, they've been trying to put him up as a challenger. This did not help. So Vader destroys the Patriot, has him laid out. He goes up for the Vader bomb, but then Brett hits the ring and he lays the Canadian flag over the Patriot's limp body. And Vader's an evil Mastodon, but he's an American evil Mastodon. And he jumps down and picks up the Canadian flag and breaks it over his knee. So Brett and Vader start brawling. The Heart Foundation arrives. They jump Vader. Patriot recovers. He chases them off, and that's the end. I have no idea what they were thinking here. I loved when, well, they're doing a TV match. Okay. Brett and Vader. So this set it up. This couldn't have waited until after Ground Zero? Nope, apparently not. <laughs> they tape it in advance. There's, okay. Anyway, point is, I loved when Brett put the flag over the guy. Vader jumps up and he turns around and very audibly he screams, what the fuck are you doing? I thought mm -hmm. I heard that. <laughs> that was his response to this flag. I'm glad you explained that he was American because I was thinking, you can't do a Vader bomb onto a flag. Apparently, even though he was going to try and kill the guy anyway, he suddenly realized they have nationality in common. That's not that what they true. do in Colorado. That Sorry? is That's true. not what they do in Colorado. What do, we, what do you mean? That's where Vader's from. Oh, they don't... Uh... <laughs> Come on, Finny. They don't the do Vader splashes on the guys covered in Canadian Absolutely flags in Colorado. I even though they share a mountain range. I have spared a couple of days and spent a couple of days in Colorado where I don't see a single Vader bomb. There you go. Yeah. So that was the only appearance of Bret Hart and his challenger, the Patriot, on this show. Wow. They recapped Owen Hart nearly killing Steve Austin at SummerSlam. Vince McMahon did a voiceover saying that Steve Austin fighting through this neck injury getting the win and climbing to his feet. The young men who saw this will grow up and tell their sons about it someday. Uh, Mr. Prober. Yes, sir. You were the only one here with a young son. That's right. Have you ever expressed to Cameron the legend of Steve Austin getting to his feet? No. A terrible father. <laughs> yeah, come on, Craig. What I liked about it was they showed it over and over again. And, I mean, there's no... His spine was compressed. Yeah. He was dropped right on his head. Over and over. He couldn't move his legs, and he barely stumbled his way through the finish. My favorite shot of it is... Hold on. 
is hold on my favorite shot of it is owen delivering the pile driver and they darken out the rest of the screen and they light up stone cold's head underneath. okay i'll let you get to this in a minute but my right. point is his spine is clearly compressed and the first thing these fucking referees do is they drag his ass to his feet and they carry him around the ring as his legs are limp underneath him. Can you imagine? Yeah. This guy could have had a broken neck. He very easily... I say it every week. I'm not exaggerating. He could have died. I mean, sometimes you'll see a guy really get hurt and, and they'll they'll drag him to the apron and they'll put him on a stretcher or something like that. And it's kind of like they should probably be a little more careful with his neck. They lifted this guy up and they like dragged him around the ring like a scarecrow. 1997. So Jim Ross goes to interview Steve Austin in his Philadelphia hotel room before Austin has a meeting with a specialist that day. So I know we all know that Steve Austin was great. You know what's really great? Legit pissed off Steve Austin. Points out, yeah, you, WWF cares about me so much they put me up in this fancy hotel room after ignoring me for two weeks. They didn't give a damn about the condition of the hottest wrestler in the business. He says, yes, I was pile driven and I dropped in my head. I lost feeling my arms and legs for nearly a full minute. Owen Hart's going to have hell to pay. I've already seen one doctor who told me to quit wrestling. I'm getting a second opinion and I'm going to make it my own goddamn mind. Either way, whatever happens, I promise Owen Hart's going to get the shit kicked out of him before I take my last breath. No matter what the doctor says, I'm going to lace up my boots, put on my tights, and after the eight years of crap I've spent getting to this point, I'm not going to let one pile driver stop me now. It says one way or another, I will be at ground zero for this four-way tag match. You got any more questions? And Ross says, no, sir. He says, get the hell out of my room. It was great. He, there was a point where he's, I, I figured it was going, there's a fruit basket, which he was not a big fan of. He starts toss, tossing the pear and the peaches at JR. I love the idea that either JR or Vince McMahon or somebody thought, you know, we're going to interview Steve Austin in his hotel room after he got his neck damn near broken off by Owen Hart. Let's bring him a fruit basket. Yeah. You never show up empty handed, Brian. By the way, if this was 2016, Stone Cold would have never wrestled again. Yeah. No. <laughs> they also wouldn't have lifted his ass up and prayed him around the ring. Like he's a fish. He's a giant marlin. The, the, there was a point where as he's ranting and going nuts, and of course the camera's only on him, and he's threatening Owen Hart's life, and he stops and looks at Jim Ross and says, don't wipe your nose, it pisses me off. And he keeps going for about four seconds, and he says, and don't smile, that pisses me off too. That's right. And I believed him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I believe that Steve, Stone Cold Steve Austin hates people who wipe their noses and smile. This led to Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker and Mankind. I have two things to say about this. I have about 50, so go ahead. All right, first off, I was watching Shawn Michaels work, which I've been doing now for 30 years or so, however long it's been. Main man Dolph Ziggler, Shawn Michaels ripoff, which is fine because we all were some way or another. But there's no way that this man can really watch Shawn Michaels matches because Shawn works so differently that I think Dolph Ziggler thinks that he works. Shawn had this reputation of taking crazy bumps because he took a few crazy bumps here and there, but really, he took so many easy, rolling, safe bumps. And he never moved a thousand miles an hour. He would do something really fast, and then he would chill out for a while. And then he would do something really fast, and he would chill out for a while. It's a, He had the best pacing of anybody I've seen in a long, long time. As far as, like, pacing a match. That's why he came back in that match when they did Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels against Owen and Bulldog. And Shawn had been sitting on his damn couch for how who knows how long with a bum knee. And he comes back, and he just blows everybody away. Because... He paced himself so well, they didn't get blown up doing that long-ass match. I think Ziggler thinks he's doing Sean, but he's really not. Not in any way, except for his gear. And the other thing is, at the very end of this match, Taker takes a chair shot right to the head. Just putting it mildly. He <laughs> cuts himself open, which I think was the first blade job since Vince Bland, uh, banned blading. Many years earlier. The Bret Hart Ric Flair match? He had he had banned it and he had fined people who had bladed in the meantime. And now that they were losing the war, all that went out the window. It's a Bret Hart Roddy Piper match, wasn't it? That was a different one. Okay. 
Brett convinced him he didn't blade in that match. I see. Anyway, point of all of this is, as much as I absolutely hated that chair shot, when we watch the build from here to Hell in a Cell, this chair shot to the head storyline is a masterpiece. The best. Now, I wish they didn't hit each other in the head with the chair, but when you watch it from start to finish... Your mind will be blown at the psychology of the usage of chairs in the Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker feud. So just remember that as we move on. Payoff is glorious. So Shawn comes out here, they're doing the entrances, and Shawn does his lewd stripper dance for China, who is totally unimpressed. I have no idea how she didn't laugh at him. Baby faces come out. Shawn is scared of the Undertaker. He tries to switch jobs with the cameraman to get out of the match. As Mankind and Hunter are brawling to start, Sean is on the apron doing crotch chops and blowjob motions to the fans. Mm -hmm. So the early part of this, in fact, for the entire match, really, Hunter and Sean, on their very first night on TV, were an all-time great heel tag team. By the way, Hunter's been okay up until this point. Mm -hmm. He gets in the ring with Shawn Michaels as his tag team partner, and it elevates him threefold. Magic. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, number one, he was teaming with Sean. Yeah. And number two, it was no longer 1996 where he was going to get punished for the curtain call. Now, by teaming with Sean, he was a made man. That's true. He had nothing to worry about. Nothing he could do whatever confidence. the hell he wanted. He had very great confidence. They had great chemistry. They always knew when to work together. They always knew when to be heels and bonking with each other. They knew when to cut the guy off. They knew when to give him a little break. They knew when to tag in and out like a well-oiled machine. It was amazing to watch. And again, on their first night as a team. And of course, Mankind's great and Taker is great. So Taker briefly gets his hands on Sean, tosses him out of the ring, and Sean calls for Rick Rude to come down. They go to break. They come back, they have the heat on Mankind, and they're just spectacular working him over. It is awesome. And Sean hits the top rope elbow, but Mankind is able to avoid both the super kick and the pedigree, and he gets the hot tag to, to Taker. And Taker is running wild on Hunter, but Sean is still avoiding him, and at last, Sean is in the apron, and Taker just hits one punch of death, and Sean goes flying off the apron into the guardrail. So, Rude threatens Taker with a chair, or as I wrote here, Tacker. Taker chases Rude, he ends up hitting a big choke slam on Hunter, then he uh, menaces Rude again, and here's Shawn Michaels with a chair. The tally whacker. No, I did not see any of those in this match. But uh, yes, Shawn Michaels catches Undertaker and hits a sickening chair shot right to the head. Legit wrapped the chair around Taker's skull. And then Taker gigs and goes down. And he goes down, and it's one of those moments, and this is like, well, I guess the streak had started, but uh, you don't see the Undertaker down like this hardly ever at all. And Shonda wasn't sure what to do. And Rude wasn't sure what to do. And Hunter wasn't sure what to do. And Taker does the zombie sit up, bleeding. So Sean hits him with a chair again. Taker goes down again. Now Rude and Hunter and Sean are still confused. Taker does the zombie sit up again. And Hunter grabs Sean and they run for the hills. Flee! <laughs> he is unstoppable. We'll die if we stay here. Leave immediately. And the all they knew was that for all their troubles, all they had done this day was they had made the, made the dead man even angrier. It was a great show. Very entertaining. Good build for Grand Zero. Great build for everything they're doing with Sean and Taker. The only thing is, they are quite visibly punting Bret Hart in the World Championship deep, 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 well, deep down the card. Yeah. You know, this is, this is the classic. The last thing on the show was great, and so you remember a great show. This was not a great show. There were a few great things on this show, but there was a lot of boring stuff with a dead crowd. That was the difference between Nitro. Nitro, the crowd's going crazy for stuff like Buff Bagwell. Yeah. And wow. then you have a main event, and granted, this week they did go crazy for the main event, but my God, as we'll get to, the finish of that main event, as a fan, oh yeah, I'm just like, this show sucks. But it was a way more exciting show from start to finish. Let me play a song first, and we'll do Nitro. A rare episode where there is no Vinny or Craig. But I have replaced these men with Lance Storm joining us here tonight. Lance, what's going on? Not too much, but I guess I got my work cut out for me replacing both Vinny and Craig. That's right. If you guys could only see the setup that we've got here tonight, 
Lance and I are sitting in a car out in front of the condo here at Cannon Beach. <laughs> Looking like, it looks like a buddy movie is what I said. <laughs> like we're two cops scoping the place out. Yeah, we both have our, I've got my iPad in front of me for my notes. You've got your laptop and we're sitting here with microphones and you've got headphones on. So we, we, we this is stakeout. That's right. If any, if any policemen drive by, I'm just going to hold up the computer here and give them the big thumbs up and they'll know that everything is cool. All right, we are going to do the retro show here. Now, if you guys were listening last week, what happened was we were talking about what to review because there was a Nitro show this week, 19 years ago, but there was no Raw because Raw was preempted for the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. So we're trying to figure out what we should review in place of Raw, and we bantered, bantied about, bantered about, bandied about. Anyway, Vinny finally says, you know what? I've never watched WWF Ground Zero. I've never watched this Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels match. Why don't we watch that for the retro show in place of retro raw? And we all said, okay, great. And so we did the whole show. We had our plan set in motion. And then I end up shutting everything off. And right as we're leaving, Vinny goes, oh, shit. I forgot. I'm not here next week. So Lance being here, we decided, well, what we should we review? And so we decided that we would review the Nitro show, obviously, and also the NWA World Championship Wrestling show, because number one, that show is usually awesome, and number two, everybody said we had to watch it this week because there were a lot of big angles and storylines that went down. So we're going to talk both of those here tonight, and to kick it off, since everybody on the internet is talking about it, we are going to talk a little bit about the Miz interview on Talking Smack that aired after SmackDown here tonight. We have not had a chance to watch SmackDown yet. Lance, you saw it. Would you like to describe it, or should I? Um, yeah, it was really weird. Um, Renee and Brian were talking about something. I'm not even sure what. I think the new championships on, on SmackDown. And Miz basically ambushed the set and started cutting a promo on Daniel Bryan. Uh, Brian started to defend himself and in doing so said that he thought Miz was a cowardly wrestler, wrestled a cowardly style, and Miz went off in probably the best, most passionate promo he's ever cut, completely burying Brian to the point where if Daniel Bryan doesn't come back, he really looks bad. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, this just happened. I don't know anything more about it than what we just talked about. I have no idea what happened in the back. I have no idea how much of this was planned, if anything. They're on a real big kick of late. The Brock Lesnar-Randy Orton deal. Three people, I think, knew what the finish was going to be. I mean, they kept it from everybody. That was one of the reasons the whole thing with Jericho went down and why he freaked out was because he didn't know what was going on. Nobody did. They, they kept everything on the down low. I don't know. I mean, I presume that they were going to do something, and this was how the show was going to go off the air. I don't know if it was supposed to go the way that it did. It was weird because Daniel Bryan was essentially in character the whole time. Because The Miz was upset that he was the Intercontinental Champion, and he hadn't been on the show, or he hadn't been given enough respect on the show. And Bryan's like, well, you know, we had you on the show a few weeks ago. And Miz gets angry, and, and Brian basically said, I don't like the way you wrestle. I, I, think you're, I think you're a coward, which, you know, his character is a coward. So then it got a little weird because Brian goes, you know, before I came to WWE, I saw a guy like you, Miz, and I thought you represented the soft style of WWE. And then he very quickly said, it's a new WWE now. They don't wrestle that soft style anymore, but you do. You look like a guy who's afraid to get hit. And this is what caused Miz to flip his lid and go crazy about the lack of respect. And the big line was, he goes, Daniel Bryan, you promised these people for a year that you were going to come back. You promised you would come back. You promised, and you never came back. You let them down. Because that's how he defended his cowardly style. He pointed out that I'm here night after night where those wrestling the other styles are getting hurt and taking upwards of a year off, basically challenging Daniel Bryan that your style got you hurt, you stupid son of a bitch. And I'm the one that's smart. I'm here day in and day out, and I'm still wrestling, and you're not. And you're the one that promised to come back, which really put Daniel behind the eight ball. That's right. He noted that in 10 years, I've never been hurt. This was The Miz. 
This is where it all became weird because if you're doing like a worked deal on Talking Smack, I mean, a character like The Miz is going to come on TV and say he never got hurt in 10 years. Like how many storyline entries has The Miz had? <laughs> Miz is now talking about something legit. Then he gets on Daniel Bryan. And of course, I find it hard to believe that Daniel Bryan was in on this to the extent that this is still, if you read interviews with Daniel Bryan, it is still a very sore spot, the fact that he can't wrestle. And this is where Daniel Bryan kind of lost it. He goes, I'd wrestle if they let me come back. And then Miz goes, well, you know what? You should just quit and go work on b in bingo halls again. And Daniel Bryan got up and walked off set, and it became very, very awkward. So I guess we'll find out what the fallout of this is over the next day or two. I'm sure we'll hear something. But as of the time we're recording this, it just happened. We don't know anything. No, and I'm really curious. Renee is either the world's greatest actress or she wasn't smartened up. Or this was a shoot. One of those three options. Yes. Because she was just sitting there with the most un uncomfortable look on her face with, I don't know what to say. And she just sat there. It was awesome. And, you know, as far as Miz goes, because that's all everybody, because I'm not the biggest Miz fan, like Daniel Bryan, obviously. And so everyone's like, Bryan, what do you think of this? What do you think of the Miz now? I'm very torn because this was probably the best promo Miz has ever cut. It was also a promo setting up match we're never going to see. Potentially. Potentially. So there is that. And I've said it a million times. Miz is a great promo. Miz is a great character. I didn't even mention this on the show last night. There's a new Miz commercial, the Domino's Pizza commercial. I know you didn't like it. You didn't even care. I watched it. I thought, God damn, the Miz is awesome in this commercial. He's great. I was more, more concerned why Miz is pushing both KFC and pizza. That's right. But the point is, Miz is a great promo. Miz is a great character. I just don't want to see Miz's soft style in the fucking WWF ring. What's wrong with that? I think we can all agree he's not the best wrestler. But yes, it was a great thing. Everybody settled. We've got no Raw because there was tennis. A bullshit sport. We should have reviewed that, that instead is... of Nitro. What are you talking about? Are you kidding me? Am I the only one that thought that Nitro was awesome? Yeah, actually. Yeah. We were just talking about how much wow. we needed it. You guys are idiots. Anyway, <laughs> a great Nitro, a great undertaker Shawn Michaels match. I guarantee you that by the end of this show, you will both agree no. that Nitro was actually awesome. You are wrong. Oh, nope. It. It's happened many times where we thought a show was either good or bad going in, and then we review it, and we realize... Man, this show was the opposite. I will say the most of the worst stuff on Nitro was at the very end. Mm -hmm. But we'll get into that. All right, we'll get into it. Because I thought the main event finish was great. While we did not watch Raw, because there was no Raw, we did all finally watch the main event of the Ground Zero pay-per-view. Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker for the very first time. Can you imagine that was the first time they wrestled? It was like they'd wrestled a million times. They had both been around forever. They had both, you know, at close to a decade at that point, it's pretty much a, a top guy all the time for The Undertaker and a top guy for half that time for Sean. But Sean was also a tag team guy for a good chunk of his career and then a mid-card guy for a good chunk of his career and he passed two or three years on top and their, their paths just never crossed. You know, Sean during this period was a total fuck-up. <laughs> I'm sure he'd tell you the same thing. Oh, yeah. But you know what? This man had so much respect for The Undertaker. He didn't try anything wacky in this match. In fact, he sold probably a lot more than he needed to. Jumping around, flopping around, getting thrown into a house. He looked like a Super Bowl. Yeah. So, he cuts a quick backstage promo, Shawn Michaels does, and didn't really say anything brilliant, but it was a Shawn Michaels at his gum-smacking, arrogant best. And he vows to put an end to The Undertaker's mystique. Then he goes out there, and it's the... It's an in-your-house show. Not the first one, not even the second one, but it's... They still have that stupid house set where they, he comes out of the garage to wrestle. Like, who thought this was a good idea? And he comes out there and they're in the Louisville Gardens. And I had to look this up. It looked so tiny here on pay-per-view. Incredibly small. I was guessing 8,000 or less. In fact, in fact, it had a capacity of 6,000 and it wasn't even full. Wow. It looked like there were 6,000 there, people there. there. Uh, less than 5,000, in fact, for the official Wikipedia attendance, which, as we all know, is never wrong. So Sean comes out, and he's Sean Michaels. He's the boy toy. He's full of himself. And out comes Undertaker. He's the dead man. He spends five minutes getting to the ring in shadows. And as soon as he gets in the ring, Sean's a different man. Sean is terrified. Sean is looking for cover. Sean is trying to hide behind the referee. And the very first spot, 
Sean shoves the referee into the Undertaker, and the Undertaker, just to make sure this man never gets in his way again, punches him out. Just a right hand straight to the face. No, uh, no confusion about this. Now, a very important point of this match is it didn't start for a long time. Mm-hmm. Brawl outside, we do need more matches where dudes get thrown into houses. This is in your house, so there's a giant house there. Let's break it down, okay? (laughs) Sean goes to leave because, he he explains to him, man, I want no part of this. This is what I signed up for. So he goes to leave. Commissioner Slaughter comes... not what he signed up for. (laughs) I think he was signing for. Perhaps he thought... There's a giant contract (laughs) in block letters, as we've seen on Raw. It says, Undertaker. Perhaps he thought Undertaker would just keep it to grappling. Ah. There was no authority figure because Undertaker had punched him out. Yes. So Sean tries to leave. Slaughter sends him back. <laughs> That's in the foreground. In the background, you see Taker helping the ref to his feet, like patting him on the back. You can almost see him apologizing. And then he picks him up and chucks him through the air into Sean. <laughs> yeah, he threw the ref. Taker was great here. Can you imagine being a referee and Sean Michaels is going to catch you? Ooh, it was Kyoto too, wasn't it? Oh, man. So this leads to... The first 10 minutes, counting the pre-match stuff, this was not a wrestling match. This was a horror movie. And Sean was the victim, and Undertaker was the monster, and it was the monster destroying the victim for 10 minutes. At one point here, very early on, Sean tried to flee by crawling up the ramp. He crawls up the ramp, across the stage, up to the front door of the house, Mm -hmm. and attempts to open the door, but it's locked. When you know it. (laughs) And here comes Michael Myers right behind him. And that right there. What should have happened is he should have fled. Mm-hmm. And Undertaker's nowhere to be found. And he tries to pull the door open. And the door doesn't pull open. And then the Undertaker pulls it open the other way. He's inside the house. And punches him. Yeah. And then he goes flying. Either that or Sean, he gets the door open. Like the big Lebowski when he made the, he put the chair against the door. Yes, and opens it, the other way. It opens the other way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either that or Sean just barely gets it unlocked to get into the house before Taker. Taker goes in the door. The door slams. There's a pause, and then Sean comes flying out the giant window. Key to all of this is, they're brawling all over the place. Undertaker's killing this man. And I know I've said many times I would love to have a match with Shawn Michaels. You can add The Undertaker to that list. Oh, yeah. I would take, and Undertaker delivered one here, I would take a press slam on the ramp from The Undertaker. Because he put him down perfectly. It sounds impossible to do. He, he held him up in the air, mm-hmm. and then he goes to slam the guy, and he turned him over in just such a way that Sean landed flat back, mm-hmm. but his heels hit a split second before the rest of his body, yes. and so it took away all the impact. Not all the impact, but... Uh, enough. I watched and I thought, dude, I'd take that from you, and you're the only one in the world yeah. that I would take that move from. So he's beating the shit out of Sean. Mm-hmm. Sean's selling, he's screaming, he's crying, and he finally gets back to the ring, and he's screaming at the ref, please DQ this guy. A second ref comes down. The match hasn't started. Yeah. He wants a DQ in life. Yes. Slaughter appears with the second referee. Sean rolls out of the ring, goes over to the ref on his on his knees, and begs, he's killing me, disqualify him. That doesn't seem like it should be against the rules. So, eventually, the bell rings, Sean scores one chop block, and you think, okay, now they're going into the heat. Nope! Taker cuts him back off, continues to kill him for a long time. By the way, the bell rang nine minutes after the brawl started. Yes. So, Sean gets crushed in the corner in in all this carnage and destruction, and then a minute later, Taker goes for old school, back when it was new school, but Sean cuts him off, and Taker gets crushed. A twist of fate! So they're having this match. It's a great wrestling match. And Taker sells for a while, but he makes his comeback, and Sean tries to run away, but Taker grabs his tights. We get the bare ass spot. We get the zombie sit up, and Sean tries to use a chair. And then Rick Rude comes out. He tosses Sean brass knucks. Sean hits Taker with brass knucks, but there's no ref, and then Rude just leaves. Oh, he did his job. Yeah, somewhere in there, by the way, the second ref got bumped. I forgot about that. So the third ref shows up to count this pin after Sean has used the brass knucks, but Taker kicks out. So Sean punches the ref. And this is the point where it stopped being a great match and became a fun brawl. Because there, we now seen three refs bumped, two of them very intentionally taken out by the competitors. 
I, myself, and all these fans, I think we're equally confused, thinking, what is the point of Anitas now? We've already seen neither guy even wants to win. Well, a couple of things. First off, this wasn't even a no-DQ match. Yeah. It was just a match. Yeah. And so it did get to the level of just insanity. It was preposterous. And then the end finally comes. We'll get to it, but it's just a DQ. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this went 10 minutes past the point that this should have been DQ'd. That, yes. Now, I remember Hell in a Cell is unbelievable. One of my favorite matches of all time. And I remember this match, like, I never even watched it a second time. Because the finish was such a mess mm -hmm. that it, like, it ruined the match for me. Now, coming back and watching it here a second time after all these years, it was a really good wrestling match. But it was still a disaster there at the end. Yeah. But the point was to set up Hell in a Cell. Yes. And you couldn't have done a better job. The first half of this was perfect pro wrestling. The second half was a mess, and not even, obviously they had to do a schmoz to set up Hell in the Cell, but the fact they did the ref punching in the middle and then wrestled 10 more minutes long after anyone really knew what was going on, understood, that, that kind of killed it for me. So none of you need to go out of your way to see this match, unless you just want to stop halfway through. The finish was a DQ. Mm -hmm. Finally, another referee ran in and just the, called for the bell. I counted four refs. The fifth referee actually called for the was bell. Was it five? Yeah. I, may, I yeah. very well may have missed one. Sean kicked Taker after the match. He got tied in the ropes. Sean was going to whack him with a chair, but Taker kicked it into his face. Geeks ran down, broke it up. Some got waffled. What is notable here is Undertaker gave the worst tombstone of his whole career to Triple H. Did you see this? There was a, well, yes. I think he fell down. It's in the post-match melee. So there's Taker, Sean, Hunter's in the ring, and all these refs, and... Taker grabs Hunter for this tombstone, and Sean walks over to them like he's going to break it up, mm -hmm. and then just stops and turns and walks away, and then Taker hit the tombstone. It looked awful. And I don't know if it was clearly not supposed to go down that way. I guess it was very important for the storyline that Hunter take this tombstone and Sean not break it up, even though Hunter fled running away like with Sean at the end. The only other notable thing is that somewhere in all this chaos, China hit Taker with an elbow. And Taker no sold it and made to stalk her down, but then the other two dudes jumped in from behind and didn't go anywhere. There is one more notable thing. You know who The Undertaker reminded me of at the end of this match? The Undertaker. Shane Taylor of Shane Taylor and Keith Lee fame. Because at the end of this match... Please explain. <laughs> at the end of this match, The Undertaker was so tired. I see. He was exhausted. He was leaning on the ropes to hold himself up as all of these refs came down, and he's probably telling them, please hold me back. I'm fucking tired. <laughs> but you know what? He had one more spot. Yeah. He had to do the running, jumping Undertaker dive over the top rope. And it did not matter how tired the Undertaker was. And he was very tired. When the time came, he built up a head of steam, and he ran, and he leaped like a motherfucker over that top rope, smashed into about 50 hog farmers on the floor, <laughs> They all fell down, and he was done for the night. But there was nothing that was going to stop this man because he was a professional. That was great. Yeah, you mentioned the hog farmers. They, they did send every geek in the world out there to break up this fight, including the Bariquas, the Nation of Domination, and the DOA, all suddenly just hanging out, trying to make peace. The best one was, yeah. <laughs> was um, Rikishi in, the, in his gimmick. He had a Sultan mask on. Right. He had a Sultan mask on, but he also had his warm-up suit his on. His Rikishi clothes on. So, <laughs> so he was about ready to leave the building, and then, oh uh oh and he had to put his mask back on and run out there. <laughs> hey, apparently, it's what it looked like. I have a better Sultan's a much snappier dresser than any of us would have guessed. Maybe. Now, Vinny, you do know that you must watch SmackDown this week. The one the, that's going on as we speak. The turn of the headbangers. It you happened. Know. <laughs> it, I, it legitimately happened. It really I got did. tweets all throughout the match. I've been getting tweets for a week. So, Apparently everyone thinks they're the first person to tell me the headbangers going back. Well, I think everyone just wants you to know how you've changed <laughs> That's, the course of humanity. And the, not for the better. <laughs> now, I haven't seen the match yet, okay? Put that on my tombstone, by the way. <laughs> I have not seen the match yet. But, let's think about this. I'm sure they're nice guys. God bless them. <laughs> They Build sucked. They tear sucked. Tear them down. In 1997. They sure did. That was 19 years ago. Uh -huh. Okay. So they're 19 years older. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They got a week's notice. Yeah. Less. They got like, how many days notice? Four or five Four days. or five days. Yeah. 
You know what? This I, cannot. This end cannot well. go well. No. You know what? They've been on the indies for years. I bet you they've gotten better. It's not. I thought about this. I was thinking about this as I as I clicked off the fifty tweets a day. I was getting saying, "Hey, the headbangers are coming." You're not the only one, by the way. It's not like they could have gotten much worse. Well, there is that. <laughs> they may actually. It it is possible. I'm sure their bodies are in worse condition in every possible way, but their their brains may be smarter. Okay, here's the problem with everyone's theory here yeah. about mm -hmm. how they're maybe better. Sure. They're 19 years older. Yes. Right. Can you please check their ages? I'll do what I can. Okay. I firmly believe that if Caden brought the headbangers to the Pacific Rim mm -hmm. for Tulalip Championship Wrestling, sure. they'd have a very, very fun and entertaining, easy match. Yeah. This ain't Tulalip. This is SmackDown national television, and there are standards that they're going to have to try to live up to. That is a fair point. I don't think this is going to end well. Could be wrong. I'm sure they're already out of the tournament. Ma let, me, let me say this again. How dare they thank the fans? They need to thank us for this spot. <laughs> Mosh is 45. Whoa. Thrasher is 47. Guess that's not that old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brian. Hey, let's talk about 